Combustible. Shifters for Everworld's Book 17 by L. Thorne. Chapter 1. Lazare's going to kick my ass. Valencia pushed the gas pedal hard with her suede boot. It wasn't like Valencia Arsino could have called her family and told them what the holdup was. A white tigress shifter of the Arsino clan of New Orleans, Louisiana. One of four white tiger shifter siblings who controlled the territory east of Houston and west of Florida. Except that Valencia lived in Georgia, and she didn't go home much anymore. Hadn't in the last few, she didn't want to think about how long it had been since the incident. Knowing her siblings, they thought she was gallivanting around, playing carefree and wild while they performed the Arsenault family duties and hosted Escape Weekend. Escape. Yeah, right. That's what she really needed, to get away. She turned into the Arsenault Point driveway and punched it, screeching to an abrupt stop as soon as she'd pulled up to the main house. There were a few people milling around, less than half a dozen, but she didn't see her big brother, who'd appointed himself her guardian, father, keeper, and God knew what else he thought he was in charge of. And we don't even live in the same state. It's not like he can fulfill any of those positions when it comes to me. Alexa and Evie were home far more than she was, with good cause, so he'd be better off trying to boss them around. She slipped the car into park, yanked the door open, and catapulted herself from the tan leather seat with preternatural speed. Her older sister Alexa stepped into view, screeching Valencia's name, irritation and concern evident. Valencia heaved a deep breath. She didn't want to explain to her big sister where she'd been, what she'd been up to. How do you even begin to tell someone about that? She glanced at the man near Alexa. Her stomach heaved. Then it unheaved. He was? No, he wasn't. But he looked. No. That wasn't him. He looked a lot like him. God, yes he did. How would I know? What if my memory's failing me? True. It had been a while since she'd seen the man's face and never in the flesh. Ever. Not once. Not that I wouldn't have liked to. She shoved that thought away. Alexa was saying something. Or was she? Then the man who looked like that someone else turned to talk to a man next to him. Valencia glanced at the man. The one he was talking to. Was. That. Someone. Else. Fuck. 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 Twins. Almost identical. Maybe they were identical. But not to her. Not a chance. Her stomach which first heaved, then unheaved, now took a flip, a fucking flip into an ice-cold ocean, then plummeted into a gravity-less freefall. She felt her eyes widen. Even felt her chin begin to drop. She clenched her jaw muscles, securing her mouth shut. That man turned from his twin and faced her. Tall, chiseled, and formidably rugged faced until a smile appeared, then handsome. Mercy he's still devilishly handsome. Her next thought, he was larger in person. Chest wide. Check. Shoulders broad. Check. Neck, no pencil neck on this man. And then to her surprise, she noticed he had muscular legs she'd often wondered back then but hard to tell from. She shoved the thought aside as if allowing it to exist burned her mind. His eyes dilated. Only a shifter would have picked up the dilation from this distance. Then again, that's exactly what Valencia Arsenault was. That man's nostrils flared. Recognition flashed in the depths of dark eyes, like a golden glow in an espresso pool. She caught her pulse going out of control. Tried to rein it in. Failed. Epically. She looked down, hoping that would do the trick. Nope. Nothing. Seeing him in person was so, so very real. That's all Valencia could remember of her short time at Arsino Point today. That man. Then she left. She was back in her car, heading home to Georgia. She couldn't remember what she said to Alexa, or what Alexa said in return. She remembered her few moments at Arsino Point, as though she were watching a silent movie, not actually there. Valencia was now hours away. 
Her pulse had settled finally, more or less. Sure it was still elevated, but not to the point where she thought her heart would give. How could this have happened? What was he doing in her life? What was he doing at Arsenault Point? What was he telling them right now? How they met? Would he admit he knew her? A searing sensation in her veins warned her of upcoming doom. She looked at the time on the dashboard. She needed to hustle, if she was going to make it home before dark. The scorching in her veins intensified. Yep, no choice, she had to get to safety. Not only for her sake, but of anyone who intercepted her. Chapter 2 No fucking way. No motherfucking way. Rory couldn't tear his gaze from the car's taillights. He'd heard Alexa call her Valencia. Fuck, why didn't I pick up the resemblance? The two sisters did favor each other. Some. Valencia was a lush, short little thing. A spitfire in a stick of dynamite, though her figure was far from a stick. An exaggerated hourglass figure, just like he liked them. With wide-set green eyes and rich red hair straight hanging past her shoulders. High cheekbones and full lips. Plump lips. Perfectly kissable lips. Damn. 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 Just like he remembered. Except now she was in the flesh. In person. In real life. IRL, they called it. It stood for in real life when people who'd met online would then meet in person, IRL. Except that had been something he and Valencia never admitted to wanting. As far as he knew, she didn't want it. As far as he knew, he couldn't handle it. His experiences left him unprepared to be involved. He studied the stunning beauty. No one could hold a candle to the short, curvy redhead that slipped behind the wheel of the cherry red BMW 3 Series and burnt rubber to get out of there. His twin brother Reese eyed him while he stared at the departing BMW. Hey. Reese nudged Rory with his elbow. You know her. Rory composed himself, then slipped his sunglasses on. Who? You okay? Rory let a breath out. Fuck no. Yeah, fine. Why? Reese's eyes narrowed into slits. Rory glanced from his brother to the car. That's Alexa's sister. Valencia. Rory knew now why she never wanted to tell him her name. He'd have known it, even if he didn't know any of the Arsenault family personally. It's not like I gave her my name either. He would have. But since she insisted on keeping it a secret, he did the same. She just drove in from Georgia. I wonder why she's leaving, Reese said, but he was looking at Rory as if he thought Rory held the answer. Georgia. Rory figured he knew what stretch of highway she'd be on. He could catch up. Then what moron? Fuck if he knew, but he'd be damned if he'd let her slip out of his life again. I'll be back, he told Reese. Wait. What? Where are you going? Quick errand. Back later. Need company. Help. Reese asked, though he looked at Alexa. Nah, stay with Alexa. Rory could tell they'd couple bonded. They didn't have to tell him. But he'd wait until they made an official announcement. It was quick and unexpected though. They went from just meeting to bam together. Rory got the whole faded mates thing his kind did. Though. His mind went to Valencia. The woman he'd met whose name he hadn't known. The woman he'd fallen for. The woman he was hell-bent on finding. The least she could do was tell him why she left him hanging. She owed him that much. Rory caught up to the red BMW a few dozen miles shy of Mobile, before the exit for Interstate 65 toward Georgia. He had no clue where the hell she lived, but he'd stay on her tail and pull over where she did. Luckily, she drove such a showy car, else he'd have struggled to find and keep up with her without arousing her notice. Behind him, the sun had already begun its journey into oblivion, and dusk was setting in. He wondered if she was going to drive all night. Not that he had a problem with that, but he sure would have appreciated a break. 
Surely she'd need gas or something, sooner or later. Rory thought of calling Reese and getting her address. It would have made life easier to know where to go. Then again, what if she didn't go home? What if she was going somewhere else? Like a boyfriend's. He scowled at the thought, fury making his muscles tighten. He rolled his neck, flexing broad shoulders, trying to ease the tension that thought created. Her brake lights lit up. Is she stopping, or is there a cop with a radar in front of her? He hoped she was slowing to exit. He'd noticed a rest area sign not too far back. Blinker. Switching lanes or exiting. Yes. She was exiting. Almost dark outside. They both took the ramp, and he kept a healthy distance between them. She parked at a rest area with three cars, a beat-up Bronco, and an 18-wheeler in the lot. Valencia exited her car, carrying the largest bag he'd ever seen for a purse, and headed toward the ladies' facilities, a brick-and-wood building not much larger than a travel trailer. The building split between the men's and ladies' restrooms and had a door to a visitor center on the side. The center was dark, clearly closed. He waited an extra second or two, then headed toward the men's, also around the back next door to the ladies. Less than a moment later, Rory hustled outside and returned to his Audi, casting a sideways glance to ascertain her beamer was still in place. It was. Rory knew women took longer in the restrooms, but damn, enough already. He glanced at the time on his cell. He wasn't entirely positive exactly when she'd entered the building, but it had been 30 minutes, he was sure. The parking lot was empty now. The 18-wheeler, two cars, gone. All but the Bronco and her BMW. And where the hell was she? The Bronco was empty, but he hadn't seen anyone in the restroom when he was in there, and there was no one else around. Broke down. Abandoned. Could have been. But that wasn't his problem. Valencia was. Concern and curiosity overrode caution, and he made a decision he hoped he wasn't going to regret. After finding there were no witnesses by using his shifter hearing and sense of smell, Rory made his way toward the ladies' part of the building. One quick final glance around the area to be sure no one would notice what he was going to do. Rory opened the door to the women's facilities and slipped inside with stealth. The restroom was dark, but his preternatural shifter vision could see everything as clearly as if daylight. Eight stalls. Eight open doors. All empty. What the fuck? There was no way she could have slipped out while he was in the restroom himself. He was way too quick. Unless she never went into the restroom. He stepped out and stood on the covered porch at the back of the building, surveying the thick woods facing him. Pine, oak, and elm trees grew in close proximity to each other, as if designed to be sentries keeping intruders out of the wooded area. They made it difficult to discern if anyone was in there. Where else would she have gone? He raised his head, lifting his nose to the air, scenting for her. Her scent was not there. Or it was too faint. Had she used Hunter's block? Either way, tracking her by scent would be no easy feat, especially not since she had at least a 30-minute start on him. What if she came out of the woods while he was looking for her? What if she drove away and he had no idea where to find her? I need to make sure she can't drive away. He sprinted toward his Audi, popped the trunk, and pulled out his emergency kit. Taking out the buck knife he'd had since a Boy Scout, he crouched low and ran toward her car, knelt by the rear tire, and slipped the blade into the rubber. A low hiss announced victory as the tire began to lose air and fell flat. That should keep her from going too far if she does return before I find her. Sorry, Tigress, he whispered, gave her beamer a pat and flipped the knife closed, shoved it in his back pocket. Chapter 3 Valencia had never considered herself the luckiest of people, but this was ridiculous. It was getting dark. Hell, it was almost completely dark, and she could feel the moon's effect. The pull was strong. The draw tugged on her essence, shutting away her shifter ways, pushing her tigress to the background. And I'm so goddamn far from home. I'm so screwed. 
she'd walked 30 minutes through the woods. She'd seen from the map that although there wasn't a state park nearby, there were several areas not inhabited. That's exactly what I need. Less possibilities for discovery, and less people that could get killed. She took a few more paces, then a few more, stealthy and careful not to attract attention, though there shouldn't be anyone out here. At all. She found the perfect spot on the perimeter of a clearing. The thickness of the trees would provide a block, not allowing much moonlight to filter through the leaves and pines. But she needed 100% protection from the moon. Valencia threw the heavy bag to the ground. It landed with a series of loud clanks, disturbing the quiet that lay heavy in the isolated woodlands. She unzipped it, the ripping sound of the metal zipper menacing in the night air. She rummaged through it, organizing the contents. Chains, padlocks, keys, duct tape, and a thick wool blanket. A change of clothing in case. She was prepared. Not that I planned to be out here. I was hoping to be at Arsino Point, safely ensconced in one of the cabins for privacy. Best laid plans and all that. To think, she'd postponed being at Arsino Point the last two nights because she knew the potential power. The fuller the moon, the stronger the effects. She'd been sure tonight would have been the best night to arrive. Who'd have thought I'd run into? Him. What if he did tell her family anything? Would it have been so bad if he'd told them about Mysticon? Would it have been the end of the world? Well, yeah. It would have been. It would have downright sucked. Then she'd have to explain her. Everything. Her life. Her decisions. Her job. Yeah, she couldn't have the wolf talking to her family. That'd never work. Ever. A snap caught her attention. A twig breaking. A raccoon. A possum. Could be any assortment of creatures. Stop panicking, she counseled herself. Her tiger snarled. She inhaled the thick air rich with pollen and forest scents. She needed to make sure there wasn't a human in the area. No animal concerned her, not really. As a tigress, there wasn't much she couldn't handle in Alabama's natural habitat. Maybe a bear. Shit. She had no idea if bears were in Alabama. What about mountain lions? God, I suck at planning. Nah, not really. It's not like she could have predicted seeking a place to hide in the backwoods of Podink. Valencia ignored the second crack, figuring yet again some local creatures that wouldn't prove harmful. She unlocked the padlock, wrapped the chain around the thickest tree trunk and knelt to collect the Well 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 what have we here? A male voice. She jumped to her feet and whirled around. Two men, large and brawny, with arms thicker than large branches. She glared at them. They had no scent and yet, she studied their long unkempt hair. Shifters. Shifters using block. She'd been known to use it herself, but Hunter's block usually meant the one using it had something to hide. What were these two hiding? What clan are you with? One of the shifters laughed. The sound, squeaky like a set of broken gears, was also loud and menacing, quieting the din of the forest's crickets. She didn't like that at all. Her tigress growled deeply in her chest. The noise grew to a roar, filling Valencia's mind, so the only thing she heard was her tigress's roar. Enough. Stop. Her tigress pushed for a shift. Valencia pushed back. It wasn't time to shift yet. Perhaps they didn't mean her harm. Just because they didn't want to claim a clan. Her tigress snarled in disagreement. She had a point. The last time Valencia was caught alone. Her tigress grumbled in agreement and pushed harder for a shift. She's perfect. Scanlan will be happy to have her, Squeaky laughed, his voice matching his laugh. Perfect for what? Who the hell is Scanlan? What are you talking about? She wished she hadn't wrapped the chain around the tree. It would have made a good weapon. Don't worry about it. Squeaky pulled his hand from behind his back and aimed a pistol in her direction. Before she could yield to her tigress's wishes and shift to attack, before she could protest or run, a dart flew from the end of the pistol and embedded in her thigh. 
The burning sensation dispersed throughout her body. Fuzziness spread alongside it. The two shifters became four, then six, then there were two again but they were surrounded by a fog. Her limbs turned to jelly. She dropped to her knees, then laid her palms against the pine needles and dirt. Valencia shook her head. She tried to get her tigress to come to the forefront, but it was silent. Pushing as hard as she could, she still couldn't get the animal to step forward. I need to shift. I need to get out of this jam, right now. Her tigress was silent. Valencia didn't realize she'd moaned in frustration until the men started to talk. Why is she still awake, Ellis? Squeaky asked. She shouldn't be. Did you put the correct dosage in? Squeaky huffed in irritation. They are pre-measured. I don't mess with that. Shoot her with another. Hell no, Squeaky said. Scanlan will kill me if she dies. It's too damned hard to find good ones these days. So we carry her? Ellis's voice raised an octave. Fuck. What if she shifts into a tiger? If the trank works, she'll stay human. Let's wait it out. Let's move her. Not while there's a chance she'll turn into a man-eater. So give her another bump of the tranquilizer. I said no. Squeaky stomped his foot near Valencia's fingers. She felt the vibrations from his boot. She turned her head, tried to focus on him. She placed her hand on his boot. Don't. She struggled to get the words out. Don't move. More struggling. She swallowed the thickness the drug placed in her throat. Me. Squeaky moved his foot, then stood on her fingers. Don't tell me what to do. You're as good as dead. He ground her fingers into the dirt. Let's move her now. The tranquilizer's potency kept Valencia from feeling what he was doing physically, but the humiliation stung. Hands slipped under her armpits, another set grabbed her legs. She was hefted into the air like a sack of vegetables, as the two men began to walk through the woods carrying her face down. It'd be easier if just one of us threw her over his back, the thug called Ellis said. You're volunteering me, I suppose. This came from Squeaky. We could take turns, Ellis offered, releasing his grasp on her legs. Valencia thought she was going to fall. She squirmed. She yelled for her tigress in her mind. Silence. What the hell? She knew her tigress wasn't unconscious. She wouldn't be out while Valencia was awake. Would she? Help me get her up then, Squeaky's voice sounded strained. Wuss. Ellis grabbed her roughly and threw her over Squeaky's shoulder. Now let's go already. Valencia landed on Squeaky's shoulder and grunted as the breath was knocked out of her. No. Valencia protested. No moonlight. Shut up, wench. Ellis smacked her on the ass with an open palm, the blow stinging. Bastard. Yeah, shut up, Squeaky parroted, following suit and striking her already tender flesh. Each step he took on the uneven terrain was like being tossed around in a bumper car without padding. Be still, Squeaky commanded after a few steps. She couldn't help it. Panic set in. They were taking her out of the protection of the trees. Valencia knew they'd gone too far when she felt the burn. It started on her forearm. She glanced down. A beam of moonlight crossed her arm. In her mind, her tigress's roar reverberated, causing Valencia to cover her ears, though she knew it would do no good. The sound was not outside her head. The burning intensified. Spread through her body, with the fierceness of a forest fire. A creaking, almost subtle and soundless, began deep within her body. Molecules loosened, reformed, tendons stretched, muscles rearranged. Valencia tried to push her tigress back, tried to keep the change from happening, but the power was too strong. This was no regular shift. This was the curse she'd brought upon herself. She raised her head. What the fuck? Ellis was staring at her. What? Squeaky pushed her off. She landed on the ground with a thud and looked at the two shifters. Her fucking eyes, Ellis exclaimed. What the hell is that about? Chapter 4 Rory managed to stay on her trail, but not because of scenting. 
Clearly, she had taken Hunter's block and eradicated her scent. What else could have stopped him from picking up her tigress's essence? The skill he was thankful for that kept Valencia Arseno on his radar in the woods was his ability to track visual signs, not his animal abilities. He'd been the best in his unit long ago. Nice to see I didn't lose my skills. Broken branches and displaced leaves, along with the occasional print, allowed him to keep up, but stay a safe distance behind. Once he'd glimpsed her, then fallen back to make sure she didn't pick him up. He'd rub the pine needle laden dirt on his body and clothes, smashed elm leaves against skin. None of this was enough to completely mask his shifter scent, but he hoped it would diffuse it somewhat. Unless the wind changed on him, he should be safe from discovery. The wind carried voices his way. A male voice. Then he heard Valencia talking. Was this a meeting? A boyfriend or lover? Fury and jealousy ran rampant through his body, clouding his judgment for a brief moment. He shoved those emotions aside. I have no rights to her. It's not like we ever. He shoved that thought aside. What the fuck was wrong with him? He slipped behind a tree trunk, concentrating his shifter hearing. There were two males. And whatever their relationship with Valencia was, one thing was certain, it wasn't friendly. He snuck closer, careful to stay behind large trunks. The men shot her with a trank. Rory knew all about tranks. You don't serve paranormal units in the military and not know about tranks. Too bad the private sector had access to them now. The special concoction, created especially for shifters, was devastatingly effective at rendering a shifter unconscious. Except, the men were confused. They'd shot Valencia with it, and she was still conscious. They hefted her, the two of them carrying her, then one slung her over his back with the help of the other guy. She landed on his shoulder with a grunt. Bastards. God, but he wanted to kill the sons of bitches. Rory reined his temper in. He needed to see if there were others and what their intentions were. A few seconds later, they smacked her on the ass. He gritted his teeth and almost rushed them. They walked a few paces. She squirmed. They dropped her on the ground unceremoniously. He stepped out from behind the tree. His wolf barely under control, pushing for a shift, wanting to kill them. He didn't have a chance. The men were freaking out and staring at Valencia. Rory looked to see why. Valencia's eyes were blood red and turning darker quickly. He'd never seen a shifter do that. It was one thing when their animal's essence flared in the depths of their eyes, but what was going on with Valencia? No, this was very different. Her features began to change. Her skull widened, claws sprouted. She bared teeth, revealing dentition that wasn't human, definitely fangs. But she hadn't shifted. She snarled at the men, jumped to her feet, still in human form but with tigress characteristics. It was as if she were frozen mid-shift. Without warning, Valencia leapt toward the men. Don't say I didn't warn you. She wrapped herself around the man with a trank pistol and sank her fangs into his neck. She twisted her head, swiveling back and forth, savaging his flesh. The other man shifted into a brown bear and released a roar. The bear rushed her. Valencia jumped off the now dead human form, his throat ravaged and bloody. The bear swung his mighty paw, claws razor sharp and lethal. Rory dashed toward them, beginning a shift that wouldn't take more than a few seconds. Shifting he practiced regularly, to keep adept and quick. He barely managed a few paces before the flurry of the scuffle between the half-shifted Valencia and the bear ceased. The bear collapsed, throat-wasted. Noticing Rory, Valencia whirled around, her face a fearsome blend yet beautiful mix of white tigress and human. Her eyes were still blood-red. Go. She stepped back. Emotions flooded Rory. She was the same woman he'd fallen for. Adrenaline coursed through his body. Anger that she'd vanished from their life together. Rage that the assholes were trying to hurt her. Concern that she'd have gotten hurt. Confusion with her half-shifting and the speed with which she'd killed the two men. 
He wasn't going anywhere. She owed him answers. I'm not leaving. Go. I have to get out of the moonlight. She stepped further back. Go before this thing makes me kill you. Chapter 5 Valencia stared at the wolf before her. What the hell was he doing here? The bloodlust seized her, urging her forward, urging her to take his life, to seek his blood. The wolf shifted to Rory quickly, then stood watching her. Her heart warred with her body, in the battlefield of her mind. A part of her wanted to kill, do nothing but kill, see and feel blood flowing. The other part of her, couldn't tear herself away from the vision before her. It was him. The man. The only one who made her body and heart react with a passion that rivaled the fierceness of the bloodlust. She stepped back, and then more, until she was out of the moonlight, until she was under the cover of the trees. The blanket. She needed to hide. She felt the bloodlust receding, her flesh returning to human. The effect of the tranquilizer was already beginning to wane. You've got to go for your own good. She looked at her hands, felt the blood on her face. She drew her hands over her thighs, wiping them on the fabric, then continued. As the moon travels across the sky, it becomes unpredictable. When moonlight touches me, things happen. Unless I'm buried under the blanket, and chained so I don't decide to move. I said I'm not going. His voice was gravelly, his wolf clearly near the surface. Let me help you get cleaned up. She shook her head, the blood on her skin beginning to get sticky and uncomfortable. You can't. Just go. I'll take care of it when the sun comes up. She backed slowly toward the deeper cover. What are you doing here? Looking for you. What the fuck do you think? Anger and frustration tinged his voice. I need you to go. She had to get under the blanket and to chain herself. Nah. I don't think so. And you can't go out after the sun comes up. Not looking like that. He pointed toward her face. You're a bloody mess. You have some explaining to do. I'm not discussing what happened here with you. Fine. Then you can discuss why you decided to stand me up and never see me again. Valencia looked down. Explaining what happened here tonight would be easier than telling him why she did what she did. It's complicated. Yeah. I get that you're a bit complicated yourself. Even though Valencia was moving away, she couldn't escape some of the tiny moonbeams that slipped through. She had to get him the hell out of there. Will you fucking go? Nope. Even if I might kill you? You won't. Not after what we shared. We didn't share anything. It was nothing. He snarled and was upon her quicker than she could have reacted. Rory pushed her against a tree trunk, his body pressed against hers. Hard muscles on her curves, trapping her. His scent reflected his emotions. This man was hellishly pissed. At her. Why? for saying we weren't anything. You're a goddamn liar, he growled, his mouth close to her ear, his breath teasing tendrils. He pulled back, stripped his shirt off and wiped at her face. Don't tell me it was nothing. Tell that to your pulse. She cursed her telltale body, watching him in a white tank, muscles rippling, heat emanating from his hard body. I can't be involved with anyone. Not with this damned bloodlust. She fought to shake his effect off and failed. I have to go. I have to get cover. From? The moon. She forced the words out with an exhale. She'd never confessed to this before. Not since it happened to her. Not since it had become a part of her life. Not to a single soul. Fine. Let's do that. You won't leave? He shook his head. Even in the dimness, she could see those features. She'd memorized his every characteristic. The full lips. The dark eyes. The high-set cheekbones. The way his mouth curled when he smiled. The way his wolf's amber light shone through when he was feeling the thrall of passion. God, why haven't I been able to get him out of my mind? He was watching her. His dark eyes seeking answers. She turned her gaze away. 
She couldn't have him seeing the responses to the unspoken questions. She asked again, you won't leave? He put his hand on hers, making her look up, then said, only to get supplies to help you get cleaned up. I have stuff. She started toward her bag, glancing behind to see if he really followed. Pissed that he was. Happy as hell, at the same time. He gave her a look. I thought I'd never see him again. Her pulse raced, though she fought to control it. And deep in her mind and in her chest, her tigress made a series of low chuffing sounds that Valencia hadn't heard in a long time. Chapter 6 Rory followed her to a tree. A length of chain, thick and shiny, surrounded the trunk. Next to it, the bag she'd been carrying, half the contents spread on the ground, half peeking from within. He studied the articles. Length of chain tape, thick dark blanket clothing. She was prepared. For what? Valencia. She looked at him, a curious gleam in her eyes. Was that because he'd said her name? Because he knew it? Of course he knew it now, he'd been around her family. Or was it because he'd never said it before? Because until today, he never knew the name of the woman he'd met and spent countless hours with, all of it online. Would you rather I call you by your screen name, Tigress Forever? A small smile curved her lip upward. God, he wanted to kiss her. He'd need to get her cleaned up. It wouldn't bode well to have anyone see her like this. He licked the pad of his thumb and ran it over her chin, clearing some blood. I have something better. She knelt and removed an item from the bag. Baby wipes? They work, don't make fun of me. She popped the top open, and the air filled with the aroma of the perfumed wipes. Pulling one from the canister, she handed it to him. Help me out? I don't have a mirror. He took the damp cloth and began slow, methodical swipes on her chin, then moving to the rest of her face. When all traces of blood were gone, he let the wipe drift to the ground, his fingers still touching her, cupping her jaw. He was torn with a dichotomy of emotions. Lust reigned, yet countered by the desire to have this woman as his forever. Love. Fuck, he didn't want to say that word. Hell, he didn't even want to think it. I don't do love. His wolf snarled at his miserable declaration. Shut up, Rory snarled back. I'm Rory, he said, because she didn't know him as anything other than Wicked Wolf. Half a year ago. Life had sucked. It wasn't that he had PTSD so much as that humanity, and shifters, had disappointed Rory. He was sick of seeing death. Sick of war. So when he came home from the service, he isolated himself. Rory had heard there was a dating site online for shifters, and other types. But other types didn't interest him. Then again, neither did shifters. Or romance. He had no interest in meeting women. But he was alone, and wanted to talk to someone. Anyone. Rory had wanted to serve his country more than he'd wanted anything else. Reese had no interest in the military, finding solace in his cabin in the Texas Hill Country. So Rory had served. Served until he'd found he had to get out or he'd make it personal. But he was all kinds of fucked up when he got home. He wanted nothing to do with people or shifters. It wasn't advertised. You couldn't troll it or find it by accident. You had to have a verifiable account and identity, but it remained private to the admins of site. Each individual could determine if they wanted to exchange personal information or even meet. He'd logged onto the Mystic Connection website, known as MysticCon by those in the know. He'd made his profile semi-private, but never put his name or location. He'd run into Tigris forever on the third day. Shortly after that, he made his profile private. He noticed hers became the same. Neither of them were open to meeting anyone else. He'd shared his deepest, darkest secrets with her. What the war did to his soul. What the killing did to him. How he'd never wanted to see or be around another living being for the longest time. He'd been Wicked Wolf. Valencia was Tigress forever. That was then, this was now.
Chapter 7 Yeah, this is definitely now. Rory. The way she said his name gave him reactions. Fuck, her damn voice was like an aphrodisiac. Some of the reactions he hoped she wouldn't see. It always had been. But now, not distorted by a microphone over a computer. Yeah, his cock twitched and strained against his pants. That was the other problem. The sexual attraction between them had been explosive from the very start. It was downright combustible. Rory what? she asked. Rory Nielsen, of Houston. And you were at Arsenault Point. She was clearly looking for elaboration. We were invited by Lazer, my brother and I. Twins. He nodded. Did I see my sister with your brother? She didn't miss much, did she? Before you left like a bat out of hell. A smile crept to his face at the memory of the way she jumped in the car. Yeah. My brother and your sister. He couldn't elaborate more on that. Hell, he followed her and never got the details on how Reese and Alexa ended up together. She released a growl, then a low scream, looked down at her leg and started to squirm. A sliver of moonlight was shining on the dark denim. The blanket. She managed the words in a hiss of pain. He grabbed a thick navy cover and flapped it open, then draped it over her. Tell me what's going on. Her eyes glowed red under the wool. No. I can't. Her voice had a hollow quality. Valencia. You need to tell me what's going on. After everything we've been through, don't you think you can trust me now? That was then. Just because I was then, doesn't mean anything has changed not for me. I can't. Fine, then tell me why you decided to vanish. I can't tell you that either. It's tied into this. Bullshit. Rory stood and walked away from the blanket. He squared his shoulders. This woman was tough. He picked up two sturdy branches and used them to make a tent out of the blanket. What are you doing? Her voice was shaky. I'm making you a blanket lean-to. Giving you cover from the moon. She looked at him, but he couldn't read the expression in her eyes. The only beings I know affected by the moon are vampires. She gasped. Really? Is that it? Are you part vampire? Her eyes narrowed. That is it. He'd been around her long enough to know her expressions, even if it was via a webcam and a headset. How could I not have noticed? How can that be? How did I not know? My home was light-proofed. I never went out at night. Barely went out during the day. It happened just before I met you. I was attacked. I came home for the weekend and foolishly went into an area I had no business being in. So now you are part vampire. She shook her head vehemently. No. But there was blood share. What the hell does that mean? It means I have certain characteristics of theirs. It's the reason I don't go out. It's the reason I was on Mysticon. Mysticon is a dating site. It's a place to get to know someone, and then take it to the next level and meet in person. She turned angry, hurt eyes in his direction. Oh yeah. Then why were we on for months and months and you never told me where you were from? Or your name? And you never asked to meet in person? I was working up to it. I wanted to. Fuck, did he ever. But he couldn't tell her that. Every damn time he thought he'd worked up the courage to ask her to take it offline, he froze. Now what was he supposed to say? I know, but I wanted to. I'm sorry. Yeah, he had no clue what to say to that. So this vampire thing. Fuck you, Rory Nielsen. I'm not a fucking vampire. I hate vampires. I have this damn curse. And I hate it. Why haven't you? Couldn't you? Is there anything that could be done about it? She exhaled in a large whoosh. I would have had to tell someone about it. Now you have. Let me help. You can't. I don't even know who could. 
This is probably the last thing in the world you want to hear, but have you thought about talking to Lazare? He seems well connected. She shook her head. Who were those guys? He indicated toward the clearing with the two dead bodies. He'd have to get those gone before anyone, human or shifter, ran across them. What did they want? I don't know. They were taking me to someone called Scanlan. Scanlan, that name meant something to him. He'd done his own fair share of research into the underground fighting ring, something Reese didn't know. Rory was pretty certain Scanlan was the guy who organized the fights. Those bastards were on Lazare's territory seeking victims. They'd been in Dallas and Houston and now New Orleans. Damn. I need to tell Lazare, Reese, and Vax about this. But not now. Right now, he finally had her back in his life. He'd never tell her the lengths he'd already gone to in order to find her. He was prepared to go farther to keep her in his life. This meeting wasn't an accident. It was fated. Tell me something. Why did you vanish? Her eyes widened. Her delicious lips parted as though she had an answer at the ready. Then she drew them into a thin line and her face became a fortress. Chapter 8 I vanished because I was falling for you. This was hard. She couldn't tell him that. Valencia looked at the man in front of her. A man she had spent a lot of time getting to know, on way too many levels over the internet. They'd become so very close. She didn't want to admit it, but he was her best friend at the time. Okay, truthfully, he was a lot more than that. He became her lover. Or as much a lover as she could have, considering they were separated by cyberspace. A heat flushed through her body, remembering the moments they'd shared on the cam. She pushed the memories back, buried them before her pheromones would give her away. God knew the bloodlust had taken away her scent. She'd become just like a vampire, yielding no scent. It was like being on permanent hunter's block. Except, she hadn't really tested it when her body reacted to being sexually excited. How could she? She never met Rory in person, and no other man had the same effect on her. He's waiting for an answer. I better come up with a reply. Something. Like right now. But she couldn't think anything viable. And she didn't want to lie. She also had no intention of telling him the truth. Something came up. My feelings for you. Hell no. Not saying that. Rory's jaw tightened, the muscles flexing beneath his fair skin. His wolf glowed golden yellow in the deepest recesses of his eyes. The memories she'd been trying to bury shot to the forefront of her mind. That expression, the way his eyes flashed and jaw tightened. It brought back the memory. A few months ago, Valencia logged on to Mysticon, checking the cam to be sure her lip gloss was just right hoping the webcam didn't add the 10 pounds they said cameras and video did. 10 pounds is a drop in a bucket for me. She'd always struggled with her curves. Then she'd grown to love them. Now she was back on the roller coaster of loving, hating her exaggerated hourglass figure. I don't know why I'm tripping like this. Rory said he loves my body. He had. He'd said that from the beginning. She blew a breath out, and waited for him to log on. She was early. She was often early. It wasn't like she ever went out. She could be online 24 to 7, since she worked on the computer as a blogger. She'd secured that position right after the incident that turned her into a hermit. Valencia thought of that night in the swamp. She'd been stupid and impulsive. Probably a bit impetuous too, rebelling against Lazare bossing her around and telling her not to take the shortcut to their friend's home. Like who could harm a shifter, she remembered thinking. She learned vampires could harm a shifter. Damn, did she ever learn. And she'd exchanged blood with one during a scuffle. Days later, she was in the throes of the bloodlust, seeking to indiscriminately kill every time the moon's light touched her. She determined the best way to deal with it was to stay indoors. So she did. Maybe she could have gone out during the day, 
but she was afraid the no-scent thing would attract the attention of other shifters, including her family. She avoided them too. My life has become so messed up. Rory was the only salvation she had. Rory's icon, a grayish-brown wolf with the screen name Wicked Wolf, lit up. Her body reacted to seeing his icon immediately, even if it was only online. A hotness rushed through her. Heated moisture pooled at her core. Muscles began an instant flexing, and right at the very center of her pleasure spot a pulsing began. Her breath was shallow. Her blood sang with pleasure at his presence. Talking to Rory did this to her. Every. Damned. Time. Except they did more than talk. A whole lot more. Valencia was no virgin when she met Rory. She thought she knew what desire was. Thing is, from the moment they started to type, there was this connection she couldn't deny. A connection that made her pulse race and shallowed her breathing while her body's yearning for the man surged. She'd never experienced this level of desire for another man. What makes this worse, I've never even seen or touched him. True. They hadn't touched. Their sex was limited to what each of them could offer and show via webcam. They'd been talking online for six months, maybe more. The first time they'd taken it to the next level had been a shock to Valencia. If someone had told her she'd have found any sexual satisfaction with a man while touching herself for him via the internet, she'd have laughed. That was before I met Rory. Their transition to intimacy was natural, even more natural than any relationship she'd been in. They'd been having sex on the computer for weeks. She thought of the first time, how nervous she'd been. How she wished alcohol had an effect on shifters because, damn, she needed something to take the edge off. That seemed like forever ago. Now here she was, waiting for him to log on. Her hair done, her outfit picked out just for him. As if we are on a real date. She had to take what she could get. She didn't have the luxury to get out of the house and go on a normal date. But Rory he didn't have the problems she had, so it baffled her. Why was this hunk of a man, this handsome example of sex on a stick, online with her? Why wasn't he dating? Attached? Something? Valencia didn't get it. But she was beyond thrilled. She didn't want to admit how much their nightly visits had come to mean to her. She glanced in the mirror she'd hung next to the computer monitor, just in case. Hair. Check. Makeup. Check. Finally, his icon lit up. A banner flashed on the bottom of her screen. Wicked Wolf has signed on. She didn't need the banner to tell her that, her pulse let her know immediately, pounding in her veins. Wicked Wolf, hey sexy. Tigress forever, hi. Wicked Wolf, can you talk? When have I not been able to talk? She was always alone at her apartment. She had nothing that interrupted her solitary existence except her moments with him. A deluge pushed through her body at the idea of talking to him, at the thought of his voice coming through the internet, sexy deep getting deeper and hoarser as he became more turned on. Vibrations pulsed through her, anticipation of what was to come. What always came. Tigress forever, I can. Headsets. She didn't want to tell him, she already had her Bluetooth headset on. Of course she did. They talked every night. They did other things some nights, but they always talked. Wicked Wolf, ready. A banner popped up on her screen. Incoming video call from Wicked Wolf. Beneath the banner were two images. One was a green button with the word accept, the other was a red button with the word decline. As if she'd decline. She glanced at the mirror to the side of the monitor, verified nothing was out of place, then clicked on the green button. A square window opened up on the screen, and in the middle, Rory's face, looking directly into his cam, looking directly into her soul. His headset was Bluetooth as well, no microphone next to his face like the last headset he used. Once he'd seen her Bluetooth headset, and tired of dealing with wires, he'd gotten one for himself. She feasted on the sight of him the easy smile that stretched across his face. A face that looked formidable in repose, 
became approachable when his lips curved upward. High cheekbones, full lips, a chiseled jawline. She drank the image of him in, lust driving her to squeeze her mouse. Next to the mouse, out of sight of the webcam's probing eye and therefore out of his sight, was her toy. It stayed close to her computer, always on the desk when she knew they'd be talking. Heat poured throughout her torso. Her heart fluttered. Was it her heart? Or her body? Hey, he said. Immediately she could see the desire was already full-blown for him, as it was for her. This wasn't going to be one of those times where they spent hours talking about this and that, while their anticipation and yearning built. No, no, it wasn't. Not one bit. This was one of those times when her pheromones were already in a fury, matched by his. His nostrils flared, his eyes dilated, signaling his need. She didn't need him to lower the cam's view to see what else signaled his desire. But just the thought of that made a clenching happen between her legs. She glanced at the toy next to the mouse pad, then back at the monitor. A tiny half-smile crooked one side of his lips upward. Busted. He'd seen her glance there, and he knew what she was looking at. Embarrassment and good kind of guilt, and even a touch of desire made a grin erupt on her face. I've thought about you all day, he groaned. His wolf and his want clearly at the surface, ready to burst through. Her breaths came in shallow waves, completely controlled by her need for him. I know exactly what you mean. The words pushed out of her lips with an exhale. Are you wet? Fuck. When he says that, it makes me more wet than I was before. It makes a jolt of sheer lust drive through me like Zeus's lightning bolt. Yes? Her words just a whisper, but she knew he could hear it, and not simply because he had supernatural shifter hearing, but also because the microphone picked up the slightest of sounds and transmitted them directly to his ears. The same way it transmitted his every sound directly to her ears. She heard the low groan, and it was magnified in her head, then it started a domino effect traveling through all of her. Her nipples stiffened against the fabric holding them in, pressing on the rough texture of the lace making them harder. Thought about you all day, his words were foreplay, like the strongest aphrodisiac, simmering in her, bringing her to a low boil. Thought about you too. When didn't she think of him? She always did. Everything she did she thought, Wicked Wolf would like this, or I wish Wicked Wolf could see this. It was as if they shared a life together. Except they didn't. She didn't dwell on that. She didn't want to dwell on things she couldn't change. New bra? A slow wicked smile snuck its way to her face. How did he know? Are you psychic? Nah, your top's a little sheer. I didn't think you had white lace. I don't, didn't. She'd ordered this one online just for him. Panties? His tormented words gave away his anguish at the thought. Matching, she said knowing she needn't say more. He groaned low under his breath yet it was like sending a direct source of energy to her hungry body. Her cam was centered above her waist, and secure with that knowledge, driven by her need, her fingers were finding their way downward on their own. Chapter 9 On his computer monitor, on the window that was supersized as large as it could be, because he wanted to see her as up close as possible. Rory had seen her glance to her right. He knew what she kept there, and he could tell from the golden gleam in her eyes and the dilation of her pupils what her body was going through. He could tell from her shallow breaths, barely making her chest rise, yet still pushing perky hard nipples against the white lace that contained them. He could tell how she wanted him. He wished he could smell how badly she needed him. He wanted to taste her need. He wanted to tongue her, feel her, finger her, and fuck her. All of the things he couldn't do through a computer. Her hand was moving south. The idea that she couldn't resist touching herself while they were talking made his dick twitched in his jeans. He glanced down at the outline the length of his cock was making against the pants. Her lids lowered in a look he'd come to know only too well. She was closing in on the target. There wasn't a chance in hell he was missing whatever happened next. Hey, he said. She looked up at him. Valencia froze, waiting for him to say something. 
wanting to lower her hand even more, wanting to feel the flesh she'd shaved earlier today, leaving it sensitive to the touch, even sensitive to the brush of fabric or the breeze the air conditioning vent pushed out, cooling and yet sensual at the same time. And still she waited, her eyes on him, the lust on his face like kerosene to her fires. Don't even think of touching that sweet pussy until you've adjusted your cam. Oh God. Those words. His voice. That did it. A growing need pulsed inside of her. Yours too. What's that? He got a wicked smile on his face. Lower yours too, she repeated, knowing he knew what she wanted. I want to see him as badly as he wants to see me. What is it you want to see when I lower it? So, we're going to do it this way. I know what he likes. A part of me likes it too. Oh, who am I kidding? I love it because it turns him on. Anything that turns Wicked Wolf on does the same to me, but exponentially so. It makes everything we do richer when I see how much it turns him on. I want to see your cock. She spoke the words low and slow, letting her tongue settle on the word cock, making the word longer more poignant. His chest rose, and the small exhaled breath that slipped out rippled through her body, as if they were connected. His eyes grew darker with desire, then his lids lowered slightly. He leaned forward, adjusting the cam so it took in his face, his torso, and his lap. The bulge in his pants, an imprint of his hardness, drew her focus. Fuck KKK. I heard that, he exclaimed. She hadn't even realized she'd gasped. Your turn, he tilted his head, waiting. Stealing herself, holding her breath because it still made her a bit self-conscious to be on cam, on display, all her faults, her over-curviness, all of that, she tipped the cam lower, watching the tiny image of herself in the corner of the square that held his image. She tipped until she'd lowered it enough that he could see what he wanted to see, but still able to see her face. It was important to both of them that they see the passion on each other's faces. How's that, she murmured. Perfect. Now what were you going to do? What do you want me to do? Two could play that game, and she liked hearing him talk dirty as much as he did her. I want you to put your hand down your skirt, then slip it into your panties. She did as he wanted, then just when she was going to take it a step further when she'd closed her eyes. Stop. Not inside. His tone was commanding. Her eyes flew open. Really? You're going to make me wait. She curled her fingers, letting them touch the tiny patch of a triangle she'd left just above her slit, but not within reach of her clit. Um hum. He stretched the sound of agreement into one that sounded like he was enjoying a delicacy. Now put your finger on your clit and... He paused. And she waited. Dying with every passing second. If he doesn't tell me to do something quick... I'm doing it whether he likes it or not. Though deep down, she did enjoy their little games of control, give and take, tease and please. And she waited a second or two, or an infinity longer. Wolf! She roared, her tigress as frustrated as Valencia. His smile grew to a grin. Put your finger on your clit. Now rub slow. She put two on. It's not like he could see, what with her skirt and her lace panties in the way. She started to move her fingers. Slow down, he cautioned. Fuck that, she moaned the words out as her fingers rubbed the spot. Harder and faster than she knew he wanted her to. She kept her eyes glued on him, waiting for him to do something. Unzip your pants, she said with a gasp. Take your skirt off first. He laid down an ultimatum. It happened quickly, like an out-of-control locomotive, the climax came barreling at her, unavoidable. Then again, why would she want to avoid it? Her body arched, then bucked as she fought to breathe normally, but lost the battle. Her climax was ripped from her body and delivered directly into the foundation of pleasure. God, she released the word with the same fervor her body had freed her orgasm. She leaned back, pulled her hand from her skirt, and half reclined, half slumped while she watched him. You're so damned wicked and disobedient. His smile told her he was teasing. Wait until the day we meet in person. I'm going to spank that ass. 
that'll never happen, the meeting, hence the spanking. But she didn't tell him that. She was rather sure he didn't intend to meet her in real life. And she damn sure knew she wouldn't ever meet him. She couldn't. She pushed the matter far from her mind. It was the last thing she needed to dwell on. Her body bucked a small spasm, a remnant of her peak. She sighed. You're not done, Wolf announced. She knew she wasn't. She knew neither of them were, but she needed a small respite. Just a tiny break to recuperate, to allow her body to back down from the heights it had just traveled to. Undress for me. Just the skirt and top. She rose to shaky legs, holding the chair for support as she stood, then peeled her skirt down and pulled the blouse over her head. Rory's eyes took a tour of her body, relishing every curve, every part, studying her, as if he were memorizing her. Fucking beautiful. Every curve. Every goddamned curve on her hourglass figure was fucking beautiful. From the full hips that tapered to her waist to her full breast, creamy flesh tipped with pink nipples that peeked through the lace bra he'd never seen before. His eyes feasted on her like a starving man at a banquet. I want you. Do you know how badly I want you? Unable to contain his wolf or his cock much longer, he ground the words out through clenched jaws. Fuck, did he ever. Every bit of her. To taste her. To feel her. To see if her voice had the same timbre in person as it did over the internet. As I want you, she whispered. Her fingers trailed over her skin, light caresses he could tell, even across cyberspace. Her gaze was focused on him, as if she were there with him, undressing for him. Fingertips traced the line of her bra, teasing him, teasing herself, dipping into the fabric, touching the hard nipples within, making them more prevalent, then exiting, trailing downward over the curve of her tummy toward the lace and satin-covered mound. A telltale damp spot bespoke of the orgasm she just had, as if she hadn't announced it with her own voice. Her fingers grazed the waistband of her panties, playing peekaboo, hiding under the fabric, then coming back up to trace the hem again, then toward her hip, then to the elastic at her thighs. A dark patch told him she'd decided to leave a tiny bit of dark auburn hair for him to see. Just enough to tease him, hiding under the fabric. She slid the satin lower a notch, revealing more of her creamy flesh, closer and closer to the trim triangle, closer and closer to the core of her pleasure. He bit back a groan, but the hand on his lap was applying firm pressure, pushing down on his cock. He felt the give and cast a quick glance down. Sure enough, there was a damp spot on the front of his pants. He moved his hand over it, not ready to have her see it, not ready for this to end. She hooked her thumbs over her hips, pulled her panties down over the full thighs he'd like to lick and tease. The flimsy lace slid down her calves and dropped out of his sight. Her legs shifted as she raised them, clearly stepping out of the frilly panties. She reached behind her with one hand, unhooked the bra, then shimmied out of it without creating more torment for him, he noted thankfully. He was more than bursting with desire to stroke his cock, to watch her do the things she did that got her off while he watched. The things that in turn took him to a level of orgasm unlike any he'd ever experienced with any woman, in person or otherwise. Valencia watched his hand, clenching and unclenching into a fist, putting pressure on the cock hidden from sight by his pants, but still very evident, and oh my god, oh so very hard. Completely naked, so into this that it was more than any other experience she'd ever had with a man. She slipped into her chair, angling her body so he could see her parted legs, her sex completely bared to him, the wetness on full display so he could see the glistening he created in her. She inched her fingers closer to her mound, then dipped one end and two. She moved them slowly and seductively, getting into the rhythm. His eyes were glued on her, moving from her fingers to her face, then back, then again. The expression on his face was mesmerizing taking her to a new level of desire. She closed her eyes, tilted her head back, body arched. The headphones transmitted the sound of clothes rustling, a zipper's teeth giving way to a tug, and then a low groan. She didn't need to look to know his cock was out, and his large hand held it. She didn't need to know, because the image of him doing what he was doing was burned into her memory. His hand was wrapped around his wide, tan-colored cock, 
stroking it from the base to the perfect mushroom head, then down while his focus was hypnotized by her fingers. Yes, she definitely knew what was going on, though her eyes were closed. She and Wicked Wolf had done this before, many times. And each time was as amazing as the time before. Her fingers picked up speed again on their own accord, as if she had no control over them. Get your toy, he rasped. She opened her eyes and reached for her toy. It was not nearly as large as he was. She could only imagine the exquisite delight of having his large cock pressing into her, touching her body from the inside, how he'd reach every part of her. Everywhere. Rory watched her exhale in anticipation. It ratcheted his desire, pushing him closer to that vortex that awaited him when he came undone. Show me what you'd do if that was my cock. Valencia looked at the toy, then lifted her eyes, her bottom lip caught prisoner by even white teeth. Her tongue darted out. He groaned when her pink tongue ran over her lips. When she touched the toy to her lips, his cock jerked and swelled more. Keeping eye contact with him, she opened her mouth and took it in slowly, her cheeks hollowing, her lips sealing just behind the head. Ah, oh, fuck, he released the words in an exhale. Fuck. Fuck. Foo. He was too close. She was going to take him there much quicker than he wanted. She took the toy deeper, gagging slightly. The sloppy wet sound made him even harder. Stop, he groaned. I need a sec. She paused, pulled the toy out of her mouth slowly, her lips still wrapped around it. She released it with a slight pop, making his cock jerk. She lowered her hand, spread her lips. Yeah, like that's not going to fucking push me over the edge. She exposed the sensitive pink bud that held power over her orgasm. Hell his too. She spread the wetness over her swollen clit, picking up a pace. Do it. She plunged the flesh-colored toy in deeply. Hold it there. No. Her rebellious response was tortured. I can't. You can. No. God. No. I need to. The toy in full. She pushed her hips up, trying to take more of it in, trying to emulate what she wanted to do without actually doing it. Trying to comply with his commands, but partially failing. She stroked the toy in and out quickly. Each time she plunged the toy in, the moisture made a sloppy sloshing sound. I love how wet you get. I can hear it. Valencia would have screamed his name had she known it. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck KKKK. His words exploded into her ears. He was close. She could tell from the tone of his voice. Another orgasm, equally strong, equally out of control, came heading her way, as unstoppable as a tornado. It grabbed her in its clutches. Raw. Hot. Untamed. She dug the nails of one hand into the chair's leather armrest while her hand worked maniacally pitching her closer and closer until she felt her muscles clasp the toy in the throes of her orgasm. She bid farewell to discretion and quiet as she began a low moan that made a fast crescendo to a scream. She collapsed, slumping forward, still grasping the leather as aftershock followed aftershock. Exhausted, spent blissful, she looked at the hard body of the man who watched her with a gentle look on his face. His wide chest and broad shoulders were coated with a film of sweat. Sweat she'd never get to feel. Never get to taste. His stomach dripped his hot white essence. Yet another thing I'll never get to taste. Hot tears burned the bridge of her nose. She didn't even know his name. Chapter 10 For months they'd logged on, spending evenings together, both of them assuming they lived too far apart to do anything about it. Both secretly happy about that, while miserable at the same time. She wished she could be around him. Wished she could have a normal life. Wished she could be like the other happy couples she read testimonials about on Mysticon's website. Couples that met online, then in person, then went on to form relationships. It wasn't meant to be, it seemed. To remind herself of how it wasn't destined, she would slip outside and let the moon touch her briefly, just enough to put the change into place, then she'd go to the mirror and study the being there. Repulsive. She knew there was no way any man, 
especially not a man like Wicked Wolf, would ever want the creature that stared back at her. Crimson eyes. Fangs. A face that dwelt between being human and a tigress. She punched the mirror, shattering it. Then stared at the blood as it dripped onto the mirror's shards. Tears followed the blood, watering down the scarlet fluid. Wicked Wolf had been the only thing she had in her life, but the extent of her feelings for him, and the fear that she, or her tigress, would push her to take their emotions to a new level, one that involved meeting in person, that meant she had to nip it immediately. When she'd realized the depth of her feelings for Wicked Wolf, Valencia did the most difficult thing she could imagine, the most difficult thing she'd ever done. She disappeared from his life. She broke her own heart. And the last few months since then had been excruciating. She'd logged on, but kept her status as invisible, knowing he couldn't see her. He'd logged on every day, at their appointed time. He'd waited for hours, and she'd watched her screen for hours, hot tears streaming down her face, knowing that her happiness was just a click away. That was then, this was now. And now he's here. And he knew her deepest and darkest. And? Her tigress emitted a low growl in Valencia's mind. Her tigress wanted to know what was next. And what? As if Valencia didn't know what her tigress wanted. Chapter 11 Rory waited for her to answer his question. Why had she vanished? Things had been so fucking perfect. He was right there, so into it, ready to take it to the next level. Then. Poof. Gone from his life. She never logged back on. He'd watched for the icon next to Tigris forever to light up. He'd even put the damned Mystic Con app on his phone, so he could check it when he wasn't at his computer. Nothing. She never logged on again. Worried that something had happened to her, he'd contacted Mystic Con and asked them to contact her. That had been futile. They'd refused to intervene, quoting some kind of bullshit about privacy and rights. Okay, the rational part of his mind got it totally. But his wolf didn't. And the part of Rory that knew she was supposed to be with him didn't get it either. So he decided to reach out. Being in the military's secret paranormal special ops unit had its perks. He had connections. He'd contacted one of the guys attached to his unit and asked if he could grab her info from the Mystic Con database. No luck. His friend said their security was too tight. Then Rory had come up with another idea. Buy the company. That way, he'd have access to all their records. He'd contacted his business broker the day before they left for Arsenault Point. And lo and behold, here she was. He'd have to cancel the buy order on Mystic Con when he got back to town. I have blood on my clothes. Nice diversion tactic, changing the subject. Since you're so prepared and all, can I take it you have a change of clothing? She nodded. And you'd like privacy? Stupid question, really, he thought. He'd seen her naked. That was on cam. That was then. Maybe she didn't feel the same way now. It was so damned hard to tell. He stood and walked away from the makeshift woolen blanket tent. He may as well take advantage of this time and call someone out to take care of the bodies. He could call Lazer and see who he could assign. Or he could call May and see if she had any contacts in the area. Nah, both those options would involve questions he would have to answer. He'd call his own guys out to handle it. They'd assume he did it, and that would be the end of the matter. They could be here before dawn if he called them right away. He fished his cell phone out of his pocket. A twig snapping caught his attention. Did those Scanlan flunkies have cohorts in the area? He poised ready to sprint back to Valencia when a large form stepped out of the shadows. Theo. Rory's shoulders slumped in relief. It wasn't someone who'd be a danger to Valencia. Then a thought hit him, and his stomach tightened in knots. The smell of death thick with blood permeated the air. Theo would have questions. Damn. Valencia would be blamed, questions would arise. Double damn. Theo cocked his head, 
nostrils on a nose perched in an olive complexion flared. I'm following Valencia. What are you doing here, Wolf? And why are there two bodies in the clearing? Rory's instincts to protect her from prying rose. She's here. They were trying to hurt her. And you did that? Theo asked. You killed them? Before Rory could answer. I'm done. Valencia's voice carried through the thickness of the forest. You can come back. A part of Rory, a huge part, rejoiced. She did want him back. Even if it was as nothing more than someone who shared her secret, at least she wasn't shutting him out. He studied Theo. What was the large lion shifter going to do now? She's waiting. Theo nodded in Valencia's general direction. And I'm guessing it's safe to say she's not expecting me. Rory nodded. Safe to say. Why are you here? When she left so abruptly, Alexa became concerned. She asked me to keep an eye on her. How the fuck did I not notice him trailing her, us? Rory knew how. He was clearly too preoccupied with keeping up with Valencia to notice. That could have been dangerous if Theo had been an enemy. Rory blew out a sigh. He wasn't, that's what counted. But from now on, no more letting his guard down. What's taking you so? Valencia stepped into view, the blanket half draped over her like a navy-colored ghost. Theo. She looked between Rory and Theo. What are you doing here? She turned an accusatory eye on Rory. You knew. He shook his head. No. He gave her a look. I was just telling Theo how I had to kill those two guys trying to take you hostage. Her eyes became slits. Wah oh. Yes. Rory saved me. I was out from a trank. Good job. Rory nodded. She'd taken his lead and run with his story. And she was in fresh clothing. They got lucky on that one. Theo would never have bought the story if she was the one with the most blood on her. As it was, Theo would assume Rory had shifted and killed them in wolf form, which would not leave blood on his clothes, unlike Valencia's weird half-shift thing. Theo frowned, as if something was on his mind, then a smile appeared. Glad you're safe. Alexa would want you to go back to Arsino Point. He stepped forward and gave her a hug. I'm not. Valencia's words were blunt. Theo's frown reappeared. Valencia took a step back. Before Rory could warn her that the toe of Theo's boot had pinned her blanket to the ground, she was stripped of the wool and stood before them, uncovered. Beams of moonlight penetrated the tree's thick cover, alighting on Valencia. A snarl, then her eyes began their transformation to crimson. Her face stretched, mouth adjusting, fangs extending. Her claws shot out from the tips of her fingers. Her face was a mask of pain from the half-shift. Theo took a step back. What the fuck? Rory rushed forward, jerking the blanket free and throwing it over Valencia, holding her, hiding her, allowing her the time to shift to herself. Theo watched them open-mouthed, his expression confused. After a few moments, a rhythmic motions and silent sobbing alerted Rory that she'd become fully human again. He kept his arms around her, shielding her, though she was still under the blanket still crying. Rory looked toward the cleaning. I was going to call my men to clean up the mess, he told Theo. I'll have it handled. Theo turned toward Valencia. His expression softened, as did his tone. Valencia. I know someone who can help you with your situation. Chapter 12 Valencia pushed the blanket away from her face, but kept it at an angle to still provide cover. She was thankful that Rory didn't move his arms. She looked at Theo. What could the lion shifter know about this? Who could possibly help me? Leandra. Leandra Matthew. Valencia knew that name, though she didn't know her personally. She'd heard a rumor or two, things whispered when no one thought she was paying attention. He nodded. How do you know that swamp witch? An amber light gleamed in the depths of Theo's dark eyes. Valencia could have sworn she saw anger flash across his face. What's up with that? Yeah. 
The anger was gone from Theo's face. I think if anyone could, she would be the one to help. Hang on. He stepped away, pulled a phone out of his pocket, spoke into it, then returned, the phone tucked away again. There will be someone here to take care of the bodies within the hour. You have guys this close? Rory asked. We're hours from Arsino Point. A different streak of panic rushed through Valencia, even though Rory told Theo he was the one who killed the two thugs. What had Theo told her family? Is that who he called? What did you say? Was that Alexa? Did you talk to her? No. I called my team. Theo patted her shoulder. Relax. I don't want to disturb Alexa. She and Reese are on the way to New Orleans to look for Evie. Why? What's Evie done? Theo shook his head. I think she's pitching a fit because Mason Martinez was at the masquerade ball. What? Evie's ex? Why was Mason there? I am so out of touch. He's part of your family now. The Tierro sister and Mason's brother Mark. She'd heard of them. She'd gotten an email from Alexa about the Tierro cousins, family members that none of the Arsino siblings had met. Another email announced their cousin Vittorio Tierro, called Vax, had taken a human as a mate and upset the old-school European apple cart. Yet one more informed her that Vela Tierro and Mark Martinez had become a couple. God, my life is a series of emails. Emails but no contact. You should come home more often. Theo's tone wasn't accusatory, but there was an underlying manner that plucked at her guilt. I know. I've had a lot going on. I can vouch for that. Rory's arm was still around her. He pulled her closer against his body. Theo cocked his head. You two know each other? Yeah. Another squeeze from Rory. Valencia leaned her cheek against his chest. He was her knight in shining armor. She'd have to leave him yet again, but for now she could enjoy his presence. His strong arms. The scent of him, all male, musky, a hint of earthiness and pine. Rory moved the blanket slightly so it covered both their faces. He looked down at her. She liked the half-wicked smile on his face. She wanted to return to it. How did I ever walk away from this? How will I again? Follow me. We'll take my truck. Give me your keys, both of you. I'll have my guys bring your cars back to the house. We'll zip to Leandra's quickly. Chapter 13 Rory looked at the time on his cell. It took the three of them a hell of a lot less time to return to Arsenault Point than it did to get to the spot where Theo found them. Theo wasn't kidding when he said they'd zip to Leandra's quickly. Theo drove past the driveway that led to the main house. You know where you're going? Valencia asked from under the cover of the blanket Rory had draped over her. He'd kept his arm around her. There was no way he was letting her go. Not after losing her the first time. He felt her heartbeat synchronizing with his, the two pulsing as one. He lifted the blanket and leaned in. I'm not letting you go, he whispered, knowing Theo could hear his words with his shifter hearing and not giving a damn if the whole world heard them. She gave him a small nod but sent him a warning with her eyes. Rory put the blanket down, leaving it open enough for her to look out. Moments later, Theo pulled onto a country road, sending pebbles and dirt flying. He kept driving, the road turning into more of a lane, then almost becoming a wide path. The plant life changed, yielding to cypress trees and reeds, the scenery more marsh than woods. Rory looked out both side windows. She lives in the boonies. Valencia adjusted the blanket, moving it aside. That's why they call her Swamp Witch. Theo slammed on the brakes, pitching them forward, no seatbelts to stop their forward momentum. Bracing himself with one hand, Rory grabbed Valencia to keep her from pitching into the dash. What the fuck? Theo glared at the blanket. Don't call her that. You don't know her. Valencia raised the blanket above her head. I'm sorry. It's what Evie and I called her when we were younger. We heard stories, her voice was genuinely contrite. 
Theo put his foot on the gas, nosing the truck forward, his profile as if cast from granite, his expression unapproachable. A few hundred yards later, he brought the truck to a stop, this one a lot less abrupt, then killed the engine. We walk from here. I don't want to risk the truck getting stuck. Should we have done this in the morning? Rory asked. So she doesn't have to be wearing this blanket? Can't. I'm leaving in the morning for New Orleans. What is it you think the SWA? She bit the words back. Leandra can do to help me. I don't know. But if anyone can, I'd put my money on her. Is she really that powerful? Rory asked. She is. Theo opened the door, pulled his large frame out of the pickup, and looked at them expectantly. Rory got out of the truck, then held the blanket above her so Valencia could get out without having to wrestle with her oversized wool protector. She gave him an appreciative glance, then slid across the bench seat. He moved the blanket along with her, ensuring she was covered the whole time. Theo flicked the button to lock the doors on the truck, then closed it softly. Make sure you don't? Valencia shoved the door closed with a loud slam. Slam the door, Theo finished his sentence. Beneath the blanket, Valencia winced visibly, then murmured a soft, I'm sorry. I'd rather not attract any attention. I should have known better. Her tone was remorseful. Theo nodded, then stepped off the road, to use the word liberally, and headed toward a cluster of trees and bushes. Ready? Rory put his arm around Valencia. She looked up at him. So ready to end this hell. The blanket moved slightly. A sliver of moonlight touched her face. She gasped. A low growl came deep within her. Her emerald eyes, glowing almost a luminescent green, were now infused with a dark crimson. Rory covered her up immediately. Careful. Chapter 14 A sob, one of pure anger at her helplessness in the situation slipped from Valencia's lips. She buried her face against his chest, breathed in his scent, breathed in his manliness, his wolf. And his love, even. I'm not weak. I'm not. This fucking situation was getting the best of her. She should have stayed home. The blanket raised high, and Rory's head slipped beneath it. I hope Leandra can help. His voice was filled with empathy, clearly suffering alongside. She pulled her cheek away from his rock-hard body. We should go. Theo's waiting. First. His lips curled into a wickedly sexy smile. She knew that look. Oh. My. God. She knew that look way too well, though she'd never seen it in person in real life. It made every sensor in her body scream for him. It was much more intense than anything they'd ever done on the computer, anything she'd ever felt with him. It was the way he looked at her, the look she knew but more powerful, like having a ball of energy bouncing between them the size of a big-ass meteor. And it was crashing and ping-ponging throughout her body and mind. Just when she thought he would be the aggressor, just when he probably thought the same, her tigress and maybe even her damned vampire blood took over. Fuck it. Fuck waiting. This was a chance she never thought she'd have with him. Ever. And now she had it. She grabbed the back of his head and pulled him close. She dug her nails into his scalp while her tongue pushed its way past his lips into his mouth. Except she didn't plan on Rory's wolf. His wolf took over, controlling her tongue, claiming her soul. Their tongues were locked in that eternal dance that couples do. The dance meant to last forever no matter what went on around them. The meeting of their tongues was perfect. It was beyond perfection. The taste of him. Male. Just male. She couldn't think of another way to describe it. All male. All sexy. A low moan escaped her. Valencia pulled away, her body on fire, her heart betraying her. And worse than her heart's betrayal, her tigresses. The feline had put her paw down, refusing to allow Valencia to shut her emotions off. Not sure how much I want to anyway. A slight crunch rock under a boot then Theo's voice. You two coming, or you want to be sitting ducks here in the open? 
You know better Valencia, as many times as Lazare preached about being in this area at night, especially alone. She knew. She knew long before that fateful cursed night she'd ventured here alone. Lazare had drilled it into her brain, don't go out to the swamps at night without adequate security. All it took was that once. After years of her obeying that rule, it only took one night to make her worst nightmares true. Coming, she whispered. She and Rory followed Theo through the brush, avoiding certain areas. Quicksand, Theo indicated with his head. He certainly knows this area well for someone who probably shouldn't. Thicker and thicker into the brush and cypress trees they went. Theo kept his steps light, treading carefully. She and Rory followed his lead. Her shifter hearing picked up the sounds of swamp creatures, animals going about their nightly business while the three of them made their way through the humid, dank environment. They slipped out of the brush, and she found herself standing on a road not much more than a path, not much different than the one they'd been on. Wouldn't it have made more sense to bring the truck this far? She brushed off the stickers accumulated on the hem of her pants, a couple slipping into her shoe, chaffing her flesh. There's a reason I came the way I did. His voice wasn't even a whisper. Humans couldn't have heard the decibel level. She'd love to hear the reason, but before she could tell him, he'd crossed the road and was stepping into another thicket. I hope she can help, was Valencia's only thought. Four figures stepped out from the brush, blocking their way. Valencia bit back her gasp. She knew exactly what they were and then she saw the wicked grin on one's pale face. He's the one. The vampire that did this to her. He was here. Theo froze in place. Rory did too. Valencia had frozen the moment she saw their shadowy silhouettes enter her line of vision. Valencia inhaled deeply, picking up no scent of him or his companions. A sneer came to her face, one she was glad was hidden by the blanket that still covered her. She felt hatred for this creature. For all of his kind. A hatred like one that had never burned in her before. Pressure erupted in Valencia's mind. Her tigress. The bloodlust. The tigress wanted their blood. The tigress wanted their deaths. The tigress wanted it more than Valencia did, if that was possible. She pushed her tigress back. This is not the time. Not yet. He hadn't seen her. She studied his features, in a way she'd never had a chance to before. He was a strikingly attractive man, in a stark way, the way an iceberg is beautiful, but you know it's deadly. He was ageless, the way humans thought shifters seemed ageless, but exponentially so for the vampire. His skin was flawless, not a single pore evident, not even to Valencia's preternatural shifter vision. His eyes were a dark red, and that instantly reminded her of what her eyes had looked like when she'd seen them in the mirror during a bout with the bloodlust. This caused hatred to burn anew, giving her tigress a foothold into a shift. An excruciating pain in her gums preceded her fangs bursting forth with tiny audible pops. Not now, Valencia snapped at her tigress in her mind. Her tigress's response was a threatening snarl. Valencia closed her eyes, concentrating all her energy on controlling the beast within that wanted nothing more than to feel their blood's life escaping their bodies. She may have closed her eyes, but the vampire's image was burning into her mind's eye. His dark hair, longer than was probably fashionable when he was turned, was now perfectly acceptable. His high cheekbones boasted an aristocratic bloodline, his thin upper lip bragged of a cruelty she knew firsthand. Tall and lean, he was far from skinny and she knew from experience he was far from weak. She squeezed her eyes tightly to make his image go away, but all she could remember was that night. Chapter 15 That night all those months ago. Valencia should have listened to Lazer. She made her way through the bayou. All alone, looking for a shortcut. Each sound made her jump, then it made her giggle nervously. I'm a shifter. What do I have to be afraid of? Less than an hour later, Valencia didn't ask herself what she had to be afraid of as she lay on the ground. She also knew the answer wasn't vampires. The answer was death. 
The hellish death that she was experiencing as she lay on the ground, covered with pale dirt and caked blood, while several vampires stood nearby, one so close she could almost touch his shoe. Polished and spotless. How can his shoes be so clean, a part of her mind wondered, while the other part tried to wrap around the notion she was dying. She had to be dying, for what else would cause this misery? Bile rose to her throat, then erupted from her lips, spewing messiness onto the hand she'd raised to stop the vomit, and onto the vampire's shoe. A half-laugh escaped her at the nasty yellowish-green spots on his shoes. Her mirth didn't last long, as yet another throw of the death she was in seized her. Anvils were splitting her head open. Or maybe it was big-ass lumberjacks wielding the largest axes known to man. The jerking upward to vomit had caused Thor's hammer to pound. Her vision clouded as the area around her turned reddish-black, with tiny pinpoints of crimson fireworks showering in the background. A chill ran through her body that had nothing to do with temperature. Her tigress pushed for a shift. She heard voices and looked at the vampires. The tall dark-haired one with the vomit-splattered shoes was talking to his cohorts. Then he turned to Valencia. You're mine now. We've bloodshared. He turned back to his friends. Think she'll do the bloodlust thing? I've never seen it. I've heard about it though. You should not have done that, one of the other vampires murmured. You know better than to bloodshare with the shifter. It's forbidden. Too many things are forbidden, by damn. I wanted to see what the fuss was about. Rumor has it that the bloodlust is only effective when the moon shines on the afflicted one. And you pick tonight of all nights to test this, a third vampire said. The night of an eclipse. I wasn't really paying attention to that. Fate created an opportunity tonight. How often do shifters come through the swamps at night anyway, Vomit Shoes said. Tisk. A fourth vampire, old and white-haired, stately but yet lethal, shook his head at Vomit Shoes' protests. The lumberjacks were back, splitting her head open again. Valencia began to thrash, flopping back and forth like a fish out of water, like a child throwing the worst tantrum ever. A piercing scream split the bayou's heavy, humid air. It took a second for Valencia to realize the sound was coming from her. In her head, Valencia called for her tigress to help but was greeted only with silence. Total and complete silence. Until the moon made an appearance. At first it was just a tiny sliver. Lava shot through her veins then traveled, seeming to fill her mind. Then the sliver grew in size, and with it the volume of the lava coursing through her body. The screaming sound was back. But now it was joined with snarling. She looked at her hands. Claws erupted from her fingertips, but they were still human hands. An excruciating pain in her mouth made her hands fly upward. Her fangs. They weren't her tiger fangs, not like they normally were, anyway they seemed more. Human-shaped. The screaming started again. Her screaming. She felt her face. It hadn't widened into her tigress's features, but it wasn't her human face. Quicker than she'd ever moved, and eager to make the burning stop, she leapt to her feet with preternatural speed and darted through the thick treed part of the swamp. The vampire's laughter followed her until she'd run so far, and gone so deep that she was almost in complete darkness. Almost. She found a large hollow log, and dropping to her hands and knees she lay on her belly, crawling into the log for refute. A snake hissed at her. Unsure if it was venomous or not, uncaring and unwilling to leave the protection of the log, she'd slashed at the snake beheading it with one quick swipe. Blood spurted from the snake's decapitated body, splashing her in the face. One drop rested on her lip, and as if not in control of her own tongue it slipped out and touched the crimson life-giving blood. The taste was salty but the effect was heady, soothing the wild beast within her. And so her bloodlust was sated, and her body kept safe from further bloodlust that first night. And her hatred for the vampires grew with every passing night. Every night, and every day she spent in isolation her hatred for the mocking vampires and some nights she even wanted vengeance. Chapter 16 That was then. This was now. And Valencia was much different than she'd been then. 
Then a mere shifter female, alone, surrounded by vampires, threatened and turned into a toy by them. Callously shared blood to turn her into a monster. A monster that destroyed her life. Now she wanted to destroy those who destroyed her. Her eyes flew open, and she knew she didn't need a mirror to see that hers matched that of the vampires. Shifters, the vampire on the left hissed. Stocky, with a blonde crew cut, he seemed the least experienced of the bunch, as if he'd not been a vampire as long as they had. Shifters on our territory, again. You're back. The vampire next to the blonde vampire pointed at Theo. Back to see your lover again? Theo's eyes narrowed. Oh yes, we know all about that. The third vampire took a step forward, looked at Rory. You were here last night, wait, no. A confused look crossed his face. You're not the same, but you are. Valencia processed this, though her tigress and bloodlust yearned to burst forth, she grasped that Reese had been here the night before. A flicker of curiosity rose in her mind. She'd have to make it a point to ask Alexa about this. What's under the blanket? This came from the vampire that had done this to her. Valencia wished she'd been able to control what happened. Bloodlust married to impetuousness compounded by her tigress's fury and need for revenge made a situation turn from subtle to explosive. She threw the blanket off, let the moon fuel her anger, let it drive her lust for their blood, for their very lives. So much happened in the next few seconds that she barely managed to process all of it. Three vampires gasped. The fourth, the one who'd done this to her, was the only one that didn't. He merely stared at her. His eyes became slits, the crimson appeared almost black behind semi-closed lids. The cruel tilt to his mouth turned slightly upward, a mocking smile crossing his face. Moonlight crisscrossed her flesh like a laser light show, but one with deadly consequences. A searing sensation followed wherever the moon made contact with her body. It spread throughout her, with the violence of a tornado. Valencia was no longer going to push her tigress back, no longer fighting to keep the change from happening. She would harness the curse. She would wreak its havoc on her enemies. It's her. She's back. The words came from his human-appearing lips, but the tone wasn't human at all. It pierced her shifter senses, set its hooks in her, pulled at her. Did you miss me? His expression was mocking. There came the point where Valencia ceased being herself, and turned into nothing more than the instrument of death, the curse she'd been given by the dark-haired, sardonic being in front of her. It was of no consequence that she went through the shift. She ignored the agony of stretching into her tigress, only to be halted by the vampire's blood mid-shift. She pushed past the blood that boiled for her to feed it. With a roar that punctuated her change, she flew at the beings, her claws extended, her body half human half tigress, her hunger all vampire. She knew this time, she would not be the loser. She would win the battle. She was far stronger than they were. At the very least, she'd die trying. Glancing back at Rory and Theo, she growled words that were distorted by her half shift. Stay back. Do not let their blood touch you. No. Rory was beginning to shift. Theo put his hand on Rory's shoulder. There is nothing you can do but make this worse by going in there. You'll distract her. Rory pushed Theo's hand away. Valencia snarled at him and turned back to the vampires. She catapulted herself onto the blonde, stocky one. He bared fangs, grabbed her shoulders. Valencia's combined tigress speed and vampire strength made her formidable. Her own body moved with such blurry speed she couldn't focus on her own hands. She sunk fangs into his neck, ripped his throat, shredding his essence, then glanced back at Rory. Shifting into his wolf, Rory's eyes were trained on her and what she'd done. His pupils dilated as though this was a surprise. Maybe it is. Maybe he didn't fully realize what she'd done to the two men in the clearing. Or maybe it's just hard as hell to get accustomed to a creature that looks like me and behaves like a killing machine. Valencia immediately turned her attention to the next vampire in line. Chapter 17 Rory shoved Theo's hand away. He almost knocked the hell out of Theo when he tried to stop him from shifting to help Valencia. He looked at the woman he loved 
at the tigress his wolf wanted. She was covered in blood. Her beautiful face was a distorted mask of pleasure and pain, as if a part of her wanted to do what she was doing more than anything else on earth, and yet a part of her loathed it. She slaughtered, there was no other way to say it, one vampire immediately. A gush of blood, the vampire shriek, and then a death rattle from between lips that blood was pouring out of. She turned to glance at Rory, as if giving him a warning. Then was on the second vampire, in no time. A tall vampire, lean and dark-haired, was watching Valencia with undisguised interest, a smile upon his face. He almost seemed friendly toward her. Rory paused mid-shift, distracted by the vampire's antics. The last vampire, auburn-haired and stockier than the dark-haired one, must have seen the writing on the wall and wasn't willing to fall victim to her berserker melee. He turned to the dark-haired tall one and screeched. Are you going to stop her, or what? Do it. Now. I cannot kill her. Why not, Rory wondered. Valencia snapped her head in the direction of the one who'd said he couldn't kill her, then turned her attention back to the second one, dug her claws into his shoulders, and with a swift bite and a ruthless shake of her head, she let his body lay where she'd slain him. Rory had no experience with vampire lore. He wouldn't have thought they'd be so easy to kill. Was it because of what she'd become? Valencia turned tortured eyes his way, studying him in his wolf form. He pushed for a sink, hoping to link with her the way shifters did when in animal form. Sinking was a way to communicate using language, silently, through their minds. She either didn't hear or feel his push, or wasn't going to acknowledge it, for she'd turned her dark red gaze onto the two vampires. I can kill her. Auburn hair leapt onto the dark-haired one, made a puncture wound, then drew his fangs across and ruptured his flesh into a gaping slash wound. Valencia grunted. Her hand flew up to her neck. Rory watched in horror as an identical injury appeared on her neck, blood gushing out. You'd kill me to kill her. The dark-haired one threw the other vampire to the ground. Clearly he was much stronger as the two of them struggled while Valencia, Rory, and Theo watched from the sidelines. Rory darted to Valencia's side and shifted back into his human form. He put his arm around her. She shook him off. Stay away. I can't guarantee the bloodlust won't want your blood next. He refused to believe she'd ever hurt him, but honored her request and stepped back. The match didn't take long. The auburn-haired one lay lifeless. Dark hair rose to his feet slowly. Now what? he asked Valencia. You die. Her eyes burned dark. Anything that happens to me will happen to you. And vice versa. We have blood shared. We are bound. She eyed him suspiciously. Don't believe me. He raised his hand, placed a nail tip on his wrist, and drew it across slowly. The flesh parted, blood began to make tiny drops, then formed a straight line along the cut. Seconds later, it began to drip, making a trail to his pinky, then flowing to the ground. The sound of the drops hitting the dirt had a note of finality. Then a second set of drops sounded, breaking the tempo of the first set. Rory looked at Valencia. Her gaze was fixed on her hand, where an identical wound dripped blood to the ground. Plop. The vampire's blood. Plip. Her blood. Plop. His. Plip. Hers. The sound felt like daggers piercing Rory. He realized what this meant. And more importantly, he could see what it meant to Valencia as she stood, watching the vampire, her half-shifted face a mask of horror as the realization sunk deeper and deeper. The vampire's laugh echoed. He turned swiftly and vanished into the darkness. Rory made to run after him. Stop. Theo's voice boomed in the darkness. You chase him, what if you become like? He glanced at Valencia without finishing his sentence. Sorry. It's just that, I know you don't want that for him. Rory looked back at Valencia and Theo. He saw the tear. He saw the raw pain on her face. Chapter 18 Valencia couldn't stop the single tear that made its way down her face. She was bound to this undead creature forever. 
unless Leandra can fix this. Rory was returning to them, abandoning his quest to hunt the vampire. Let's go see the witch. He picked up the blanket, shook it off, then raised it up. Valencia slipped beneath it. The walk to the cabin from the site of the battlefield was short. It seemed fewer than ten minutes before they were walking up a ramp to a dilapidated cabin resting on stilts raised above the swamp waters. A barefooted, chemise-clad dark-haired woman, braids drifting down her back, eyes luminescent silver in the darkness, skin the color of a caramel macchiato rose from a chair in the corner of the porch. She approached the ramp as the trio ascended. She glanced at Rory. The other brother. She turned her glowing gaze toward blanket-hidden Valencia and cocked her head. And the other Arsino sister. How the hell does she know it's me beneath this blanket? What was Reese doing here? Leandra. Theo's voice had changed. It had a timbre, emotion laden. Lion shifter. Her tone had softened, her eyes as well. Leandra stepped close to Theo, her body meeting his as though they were meant to be. Valencia watched their synergy. How long has this been going on? Leandra turned that silver stare her way. Into the cabin, with you. You know? Valencia followed Leandra inside, trailed by Rory while Theo brought up the rear. There's not much that goes on in the bayou that Leandra Matthew doesn't know. Theo closed the door, then leaned against it as if guarding them. Or keeping us captive, Valencia thought. Leandra traveled from one window to the second one, closing blinds, then drawing dark curtains over them, leaving the cabin in complete darkness save one tiny hurricane lamp with a flickering flame on a table with a threadbare covering. Rory lifted the blanket, removing her cover. I'm Valencia Arsino, Valencia told the witch, certain she already knew, wondering if there was anything she didn't know. Alexa's little sister. The witch nodded. Leandra met you, as I'm sure you know by now. Can you help her? Rory wasted no time getting to the point his hand snaking its way around Valencia's waist. I have bloodlust. A vampire blood shared with me. I've been hiding since it happened. I don't come out of my apartment, Valencia blurted out, regardless that the witch clearly knew so much already. Theo looked at her, then at Rory. A question in his eyes. Valencia could only imagine what he was thinking. He has to be wondering how we met if I don't come out. A blush rose to her cheeks at the thought of the things she and Rory did online. Very pleasurable things, but did the witch know? Could Theo tell from her embarrassment? I'm a grown woman, what I do sexually is my own business. Rory was looking at her oddly, probably wondering why I'm so embarrassed. So can you help her? Cure her? Rory asked again. I'm familiar with her condition, Leandra told him. She turned toward Valencia, put her hand on Valencia's wrist where her shifter healing had rendered the torn flesh from earlier into a pink scar, fading closer to white with every passing moment. How did you know what it was called? Leandra asked her. The vampire was bragging while I lay on the ground going through this change. Can you heal me, can you make it go away? No. Leandra shook her head, a sad look on her face. The most I can do is help you control the bloodlust effect, so you don't have to hide. I can help you control the shifting. You'll have to retrain yourself. I'm simply giving you the tools. Is this what happens when vampires turn humans into their own kind? They become tied with the bloodshare? They die when the other one dies? Leandra's brows dipped into a frown. I wish. Wouldn't that be simpler? they'd rid the earth of their own kind. But unfortunately, no. That attribute is specific to shifters the vampires have bloodshared. A knock sounded at the door. Theo cocked his head, glancing at Leandra with a questioning look. Expecting someone? I never expect anyone. Every visitor is a surprise. Every cause I'm asked to assist with is a surprise. Open it. He stepped away from the door, and put his hand on the knob. Mindful of the moonlight, Valencia opened her mouth to protest. It's not like it's locked, but not yet. 
Leandra motioned to Valencia and Rory. Get the blanket in the corner by the cot, you should be safe, but... She gave a one-shoulder shrug, very old-world European, Valencia noted. Rory grabbed the blanket and hustled Valencia to the corner. Not that she needed much hustling. She was in no mood to deal with the bloodlust again. At all. Leandra nodded to Theo, but before he could open the door it flew open. Chapter 19 Rory held the blanket in such a way to ensure that Valencia wasn't left out of whatever was going on, but it was at the ready to provide the precious cover he knew she needed. The door flew open, the knob cracking against the wall. A woman walked in. Her skin was pale, the milkiest of creams, but not white, more like the softest acru. Her eyes gleamed a radiant pastel yellow. Hanging down her back past her hind side, her hair was as light a blonde as could be imagined, but not ash blonde, more of the color of corn husk. It was as if the woman was made of sunlight, including sunlight within her, glowing from within those eerie eyes. She was dressed in a long gown, tattered at the hemline, her feet bare. A large, shiny metal medallion dangled from a necklace. What's with this barefoot witch thing? Leandra. That's all the yellow witch said. Adelise. Leandra stepped between the yellow witch and her view of Valencia. To what do I owe this honor? Word travels, Adelise said. I've been sent. What do you think you are doing? You don't belong here, witch. Theo stepped within touching distance of Adelise. Adelise raised her hand, shoulder high, palm out. Lion shifter. A sneer appeared on her face. She flipped her wrist, twisted her hand. Theo buckled, doubled over, a grunt the only sound that came from him. Valencia gasped. Rory snarled a warning, worried that Valencia's bloodlust would be awakened by the witch's aggression toward Theo. Leandra tossed both hands up high, as if beseeching the sky, then dropped them suddenly as if pushing something down. Do not bring your magic to my home. Adelise's hand dropped. Theo rose. His face was pale, in the depths of his eyes his lion glowed. His face began a transformation, he was morphing into his lion. Leandra put her hand on his chest, looked deep into his eyes. Theodorus. Her hand moved in a deliberate circle. No shifting right now, please. He nodded, the amber in his eyes receding. Who are they? Adelise indicated Rory and the still-blanketed Valencia. My guest. As Adelise turned back to address Leandra, a beam of moonlight struck her medallion necklace and reflected the light directly into the blanket. Under the wool, a deep growl emitted. Rory felt the rumbling of Valencia's half-shift seconds before she ripped the blanket from her head and flew toward Adelise. Leandra extended both hands. Her silver eyes glowed. A powerful magic emanated from her, making her body shimmer. Valencia froze, mid-attack. She couldn't move her body. She turned to look at Leandra. I can't have one of the Black Glade Coven killed in my cabin. It won't do. She flipped her wrist toward the entrance. The door slammed shut of its own accord. Adelise stared at Valencia open mouth as Valencia reverted to the beautiful, curvy woman Rory loved. A hybrid. A shifter vampire hybrid. Her eyes widened with fear. You know her kind must be destroyed. Does the coven know she exists? Leandra shook her head, braids flying. I don't worry about what the Black Glade Coven knows. I don't answer to them. Right now. Don't think your bloodline will protect you forever. Adelise inched backward, closer to the door. Rory pulled a still-open-mouthed Valencia closer to him. Deeper into the corner, he reached for the blanket providing her cover, because in all likelihood, the door would be opened again soon. She's one of the Arsino. She has vampire blood now. She's doubly cursed. That's not a matter for you to concern yourself with, Adelise. Go back to the coven. Tell them you came here. But do not tell them what you've seen. I will hear about it if you do. Adelise stood straighter, her spine stiff. 
I'm not the same young witch you defeated once, long ago, Leandra Matthew. I am much better now. As am I, Leandra indicated the door with a slight head motion. You've exhausted my hospitality. Adelise turned on her heel, giving them her back. With a swift yank she opened the door and slipped out, closing it behind her with fervor. The tiny cabin shook from the effect. Leandra turned to Valencia. My apologies. What was that about? Valencia asked. Don't worry yourself with it. Which business is not for shifters to be concerned with? Leandra rubbed her arms as though she was cold, though the weather was far from chilly in the temperate swamp. But, Valencia began. Theo gave Valencia and Rory a warning look. Let's stay out of her business, as we'd want witches to stay out of ours. So all witches will want me dead. And that won't change after you do what you do. No. All that will change is your ability to manage the shifting and the bloodlust. Great. Just fucking great. Unless I run into vampires. Or witches. Or maybe if my own kind finds out about me. That'd be a witch hunt. Except they'd be hunting a hybrid. She fought to keep the grimace from appearing on her face at the predicament she was in. Let's get the show on the road, Theo said. I have plans in the morning. I'll need some of your blood, Leandra explained, pulling a vial from the bookshelf near the door. And when you are cut, your vampire will be cut as well. He's not my fucking vampire. Leandra pushed her braids back, securing them with a piece of ribbon. No, he's not, but he's your bloodshare brother. Fuck that. Don't use the word brother in the same sentence as that undead bastard. And I don't give a shit if he's cut. For all he knows I'm fighting. He won't have a clue what we're doing. You underestimate him. You know him? Can you defeat him? Under the right circumstances. Under the wrong ones, he can defeat me. Can I defeat him? You would die trying, possibly. Or you could kill yourself, that would defeat him. Fuck no. Rory's response was exhaled with a hiss. That's a deal breaker. Leandra held a knife out to Valencia. You got this. Or do you need me to do it? I can handle it. Valencia took the knife and the vial. One swift run of the sharp blade against her flesh, and the vial was collecting blood. I don't need much. That's a good thing, because it's going to start healing. Though I could recut it if you need me to. No, that's enough. Leandra handed her a white handkerchief from the shelf. Staunch it with this until it closes over. She strode to the door. I'll be back. Valencia placed the fabric over the cut. Wait, where are you going? I'll need privacy for what I'm going to do next, and I won't ask you to wait outside. The last thing we need is you being caught leading to another incident. I hate that you have to leave your own home. I'm not leaving. I'm simply stepping outside to another little spot I have a few yards away. Theo and Rory will stay to take care of you. They're not as powerful as I am. How can they possibly take care of me? Valencia didn't let the words come out. Who will protect you? This is my swamp. No one bothers me here. I'll be back shortly. Valencia crossed her arms over her chest. My brother wouldn't like what is going on here. Leandra looked from Theo to Valencia. Are you planning to tell him? Not a chance. A wickedly conspiratorial smile curved Valencia's lips. Chapter 20 Rory sat on the couch next to Valencia. She wasn't giving any outside appearance of being nervous but her pulse was racing. Rory's wolf could feel it. He reached for her hand. It will be fine. Valencia glanced at him. Her pulse still raced, though her look was appreciative. Rory realized how hollow that sounded. How could he guarantee that? He couldn't. There was nothing he could do but be there for her and protect her. Theo watched them, his large frame in a chair at the table. He tapped on the surface, his own apprehension evident. 
What's Leandra's story? Valencia asked him. She's private. So you don't know. Valencia pressured him. Theo looked away. I didn't say that. My brother was here, Rory added, hoping this would prompt Theo to discuss the matter. Theo pushed the chair back, walked toward the door. She's returning. Leandra opened the door just enough to slip in, then closed it behind her. She departed with the vial of blood, but returned empty-handed. She looked from Rory to Valencia, then turned her silver gaze to Theo. It is done. Valencia stood. I don't feel any different. Can I go outside to test it? No. There's no immediate change. You need to stay here tonight. Your blood was thick. You've shifted too many times already this evening. Risking another shift could be adverse for your health. Here in my cabin, you'll be safer than out in the woods. Rory thought of Adelise. It didn't seem that any of them were very safe. Leandra glanced at him. I can protect you better here. She turned back to Valencia. By tonight you'll have enough impulse control to keep the bloodlust at bay, as long as you are not pushed emotionally. You need some time to relearn harnessing your tigress so you're not pushed into a hybrid shift. After today, the moon won't be your worst enemy. You'll be your own worst enemy if you don't keep control. I'll be there to help her, Rory affirmed. I need to talk to you, Leandra told Theo. You two can stay here for the night. We'll be back at dawn. It will be safe for you to leave then. By the next nightfall, things should be improving for you. Is it safe for Valencia, for us to be here alone? I'd be more concerned for anyone who crosses her. A hybrid of her type is extremely dangerous. But we'll be a few yards away in another cabin, keeping an eye on this one. You needn't worry though. I've put protection on the cabin. Leandra and Theo left. I wonder what kind of protection. Valencia looked at the closed door, she shook her head. Theo and Leandra. A shifter and a witch. That's uncommon. God if my brother finds out. He will eventually you know, Rory told her. Why do you say that? It's his territory. And whatever they have between them doesn't seem temporary. Shit. There will be hell to pay when Lazare finds out. Worse than hell when he learns you're a hybrid? Valencia gasped and did a double take. I'm not telling him. You can't keep it from your family. I have so far. Rory didn't respond. What? She paced the tiny cabin, a tigress in human form, impatient, agitated. What are you thinking? What am I supposed to tell them? What about us? You have to tell them about us. She whirled around. What us? Rory strode to her. Took her in his arms. The world around her melted away. An amber glow flickered in his eyes. His lips drew close to hers, his breath warm. God yes. His lips danced across hers, then trailed over her jaw, her neck, then back up to her mouth. His tongue claimed hers, fiercely, decadent, heated, he pulled her into a tunnel that whirled out of control. She pulled away, her head spinning. You're not running away again. You're mine forever. He nipped at her jawline. No argument here. Valencia tucked her head under his chin, listening to his heartbeat. Her own pulse slowed to match his, beating in tandem. Prove it. His words were a challenge, they flowed over Valencia, her tigress and her bloodlust. His gaze dipped first to her lips, then to her breasts, then down her whole body. He raised his eyes to hers. Well? She could do nothing but meet the challenge, head on. He was everything she wanted, and he was the one thing she thought she'd lost forever when she made that difficult decision. Swiftly she kissed him, taking his tongue captive then giving him her mouth as his prisoner. He moved his hand into her hair, wrapped it around his fingers, twining, drawing her head back, giving his aggression to match her aggression, his need to match her need. He pinned her to the wall, his muscled body not giving her an option to move. She could feel his cock pressing against her. Hard, wonderfully so, and big. God. So much bigger than her toy. 
so much bigger than it had even appeared on the cam. She slipped her hands under his shirt, running her fingers over hard muscles, a wide chest, slightly sprinkled with hair. She scored his flesh with her nails while he teased her mouth with his lips and tongue. Before she could completely comprehend what he was doing, and with a speed that matched the urgency that beat a rhythm in her pulse, he had her pants and panties off, and his too. He planted his hands on her ass and lifted her. She wrapped her legs around his waist. His cock a firm reminder against her throbbing core. Rory spun a 180 and sat her on the table, leaning in and tracing her lips with his tongue. Mine. His word was a growl. He ran his hands up and down the side of her body, grazing her breasts though the fabric of her top and bra between his flesh and hers. He toured her body, exploring without apology, then he lowered one hand, teasing her pussy lightly, running feathery touches along her folds. Swiftly, without warning he plunged two fingers deep inside her. She gasped lightly close to his ear. God I love that. I've always loved that sound. Then Rory held his hand still, completely unmoving while his cock rested against her thigh, reminding her of his own needs. His thumb put pressure on her clit, then moved in slow circles while his fingers were unmoving still deep inside her. Her muscles clenched. She writhed, trying to get more. His eyes grew darker, his pupils dilating, then gold flickering in the depths. A tormented moan was ripped from her throat. Valencia wrapped her fingers around his length, pressed his head against her folds next to his still buried hand. Fuck it. He removed his fingers and drove his cock deep inside her. Valencia grunted from the fierceness of his entry and the width of his cock. It didn't take long for her body to adjust to accommodate his size. He stroked in and out of her, each motion releasing a wonderfully sloppy sexy sound. He slipped his hands under her ass pulling her closer, each drive going deeper striking her everywhere. Oh my god Rory, she breathed. Then the realization of what she'd done hit her. She could say his name. Tears of happiness welled in her eyes. She arched her back into him, taking more of him, all of him. Valencia, he drove into her quickly swiftly over and over. I can't last much longer. Don't. Let it go. I'm sealing the deal. He lowered his head, lips touching that sensitive spot between her neck and shoulder, and sunk his teeth into her flesh. Ah. The agony of it burst through her lips in a low groan. Then just as quickly, the agony was replaced with the pleasure of his tongue licking at the wound, sealing their couple bond. He sunk his cock in deeply. She felt the heat of his climax striking her core and leaned forward, her lips resting against his neck. Her tigress took over. With one swift bite, she'd marked him the same way he'd marked her. She licked at his wound. Then it struck her. The bloodlust was at bay. Whatever Leandra did, was working. She didn't have a moment to think on it further, as she was snatched from mid-thought by an orgasm. She was propelled into another plane, where she was spinning round and round, holding onto to Rory while the world whirled. Chapter 21 Rory nuzzled Valencia's shoulder. Hey. She stretched on the small cot, laying on his body, marveling that the contraption hadn't collapsed under their joined weight. I could lay here forever. I'd personally like a real bed, he said in mock protest. My muscles are cramped. Complaints already. We haven't even been bonded for a full day yet. She slipped her hand under his t-shirt, dug her fingernails into his chest scoring the flesh. Damn woman. You're going to get things started all over again. And that's a bad thing. Not at all but look. He glanced at the shutters. Tiny slivers of sunlight slipped through. Dawn. She shoved of his chest, landing on the floor, sure-footed as her tigress. Let's get out of here. Valencia tossed clothing on. Leandra and Theo stepped on the ramp when Rory and Valencia walked through the cabin's door. Leandra let go of Theo's hand as soon as she saw them. How do you feel? she asked Valencia. Then her eyes narrowed and studied them, her gaze traveling between Rory and Valencia. I see the deed is done. A pink tint colored Valencia's cheeks, then was quickly eclipsed by her smile. Rory took her hand and squeezed it. 
forever right. Forever, Valencia said under her breath, nodding. Valencia wondered if she did wrong by having bonded with Rory. Nothing felt more right than what they did last night, but what would happen to him if she lost it during the bloodlust? That was damn selfish of me. I put my desire to be with him forever over his well-being. Leandra stepped forward, took Valencia's hand, and pulled her away from Rory. Come with me. Where are we going? I want a moment with you, Leandra tugged. They walked down the ramp toward the brush and reeds. She took her toward a path that led to the water. Mosquitoes buzzed where it sang toads croaked. Leandra stopped, sat on a log. We can't stay long, but I needed to tell you something. She patted the spot next to her. Leandra plucked at a weed, pulled it from the ground, tucked it between her lips, then blew on it. The tiny plant made a whistling sound. Valencia sat, silent, waiting for Leandra's thoughts. There was something about this witch, something Valencia liked. She felt a kinship for her, and it went beyond the help she'd offered her with the bloodlust. Rory is the one for you. Do not question it. What you've done is right. For both of you. You have a destiny to fulfill, and he'll be there with you. What do you mean? It's not that clear for me. I'm not psychic. I see things, but not clearly. More in a vague way. So you can't tell me more? You need to stop second-guessing your bond with the wolf. What about you and Theo? Why haven't you bonded? It's clear you have feelings. That's a complicated situation. Because of Lazare. Leandra nodded. And he's a shifter. I'm a witch. You know the taboos on that sort of thing. And some sex and covens are more restrictive. She tore the little plant into shreds. And now we have to go. Leandra stood, and without waiting for Valencia, began the walk back to the cabin. I'm not sure what I was supposed to get out of that talk. I guess that Rory and I should be together. Rory and Theo sat on the porch, watching them approach. Rory raised his brows, gave a little shrug like, what's up? Valencia shrugged back, shook her head slightly as if to say, nothing. I have to head out for New Orleans, Theo said. I'll drop you two off at Arsenault Point, at a cabin, so you can get cleaned up and get your story straight. As far as I'm concerned, I simply brought Valencia home. Your cars are already there, in the garage, being detailed. Theo was nothing if not thorough. Thank you, Valencia said. For everything, Rory added. I'll call Alexa. I'm going to New Orleans to help them find Evie. To keep Lazare from killing her for being so impetuous and irresponsible. I doubt Lazare or Alexa are in a position to judge anyone, Leandra said. Theo nodded. It's been an interesting escape weekend this year. What did I miss? Valencia wondered. Let's hope that finding Evie doesn't prove anywhere near as interesting, Leandra said with a mysterious smile. But knowing the Arsenault clan, I'm not holding out any hope. Bite your tongue, witch. Theo tugged on one of her braids gently. I'll need a moment to pack. Leandra slapped his hand away. Theo frowned. Where are you going? With you. She slipped inside. Oh, hell to the no, Theo exclaimed. Rory fought to keep the smile from creeping to his face. The lion shifter has his hands full with that witch, that's for damn sure. Typical. She makes a decision, then she's gone. As if that's that. Theo released a growl. A golden glow flickered in his dark eyes. He opened the door. Followed Leandra inside. Rory and Valencia fought to keep straight faces while the two inside exchanged terse words. I said, I'm going with you. Lazer won't like it. I'll handle Lazer, Leandra said. She popped her head outside, caught Rory and Valencia mid-laugh. She glowered at them. Shifters. PFF. She blew out an exasperated breath. So hard-headed. And witches aren't. Theo appeared behind her, asking softly close to her ear. Rory glanced at Valencia, admiring the strong jaw, the firm set to her lips. 
She wasn't going to be an easy woman, either. Just like the witch, this hybrid shifter he'd fallen in love with and taken for a mate was bound to keep his life full of excitement. Epilogue I'm glad you're going with me, Valencia reached across the car seat, placed her hand on Rory's. Can't imagine anywhere else I'd rather be. He glanced at her. I packed your blanket. Just in case. Leandra texted, they're ahead of us by an hour. Texted. He pulled his gaze back to the road. You two became close. I like her. A lot. I think what she did worked. I mean when we couple bonded, when I bit you, I didn't feel the bloodlust trying to take over like it can when blood's involved. A grin spread over Rory's face. That's cause for celebration. He took her hand. You're right, Leandra seems a decent sort, Rory admitted. For a witch. And if she's been successful with your matter, then hell, she's a miracle worker. Hey, let me call Alexa and let her know we're on the way. Valencia reached for her phone, pressed Alexa's picture in the contact section. It rang twice, then she heard her sister's voice. Where are you guys? What's up with Evie? Can't find her. She's gone. Alexa's tone was panicked. We're coming. Be there soon. Alexa released a sob. She's disappeared. She and Mason came on the tour bus. Now they're both gone. It's all my fault. I should have. Another sob. I don't know what I could have done. Maybe they're together, Valencia offered. She hates him. But even if they were together, why aren't they answering their phones? Valencia looked at Rory and thought of the attraction she had for the wolf shifter. How the very sound of his voice made her body react. I can think of a million reasons why they wouldn't answer their phones. I'm glad you're coming. Call me when you hit New Orleans. I'll tell you where we are. Hopefully by then we'll have found both of them. Alexa ended the connection. I guess we'll see what Evie and Mason are up to. Probably find them at a hotel. Evie's the temperamental one. She's kept us on our toes most our lives. And you're not prone to keeping anyone on their toes, are you? Rory shook his head, but deep within his eyes, a glimmer of his wolf told her everything she needed to know. Rory was in it for good. He wouldn't let her down. Ouch. He glanced at her. What? She held up her palm. There was a tiny cut on it. The damned vampire. Did that happen a lot after you were turned? Yeah, but I thought I was having accidents and not noticing them. Like maybe I was clumsy. Some of them happened during my sleep, but with my shifter healing suddenly there'd be a new scar when I woke up. That must have been confusing. Rory. Yeah? What if he is killed? What if he dies? I don't want to die too. I've been thinking of that. We'll have to make sure no one we know kills him. Now I have to keep a damned vampire safe. If it means keeping you alive, you bet. Great. Just great, Valencia grumbled. Do you think he feels the same compulsion? I'm not even sure vampires have feelings, Rory said. It kind of sucks thinking that anything could happen to him, and then suddenly, poof, I'm dead. Yeah, but you could say the same thing about anyone at any time. A car crash, plane crash. He gave her a sideways glance. That reminds me, seems I heard someone say you had an issue with flying in airplanes. Only because of the bloodlust. I couldn't afford to be caught in a situation I couldn't control. Like a layover, or a delay, or anything like that. She traced a pattern on her leg absent-mindedly. Imagine half-shifting on a plane. That could get ugly. Rory laughed. Do you feel any different since Leandra did her thing? Whatever that thing is. Not really. Maybe we can test it this evening. Just a little. Sure. Right after we find your sister. And right after we get some privacy. He gave her a slow wink. A bolt of lightning composed of pure desire flooded through her veins, pooled in her midsection. Her breathing became labored and her pulse raced. 
just the way it always did around this man. She released a slow sigh. Whatever obstacles they had, they'd work through them together. Rory Nielsen wouldn't let her down. Ever. She knew that with every fiber of her being, both the inherent shifter and the semi-recently acquired vampire. I'm yours, you know. There won't ever be another. Likewise. Rory covered her hand with his, making her yearning burn deeper. Ever. Unknown as it was, Valencia anticipated the future with Rory. Always with Rory. This was now. Thank you for listening. This has been a Shifters Forever Worlds book by L. Thorne. Stay tuned for more episodes. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.